Welcome back to episode 132 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. As always, I'm here with Troy. What's going on, Troy? Another busy weekend for you and hockey life? Busy weekend coaching for high school. We had three scrimmages to kind of get ready. 25-minute halves with a five-minute warm-up. And we did very well. We dominated. We got to scrimmage against Andover, who's kind of turning into one of our rivals. They've, I think, won the state title... I don't know, probably two or three times the last five years. And it turned into a boys hockey game with lots of checking, lots of fighting, lots of pushing. It was awesome. And nice. yeah, it was a fun, fun time. We definitely have speed and we're going to be good this year. So we'll see how it plays out. And then my son had games and they lost both of them. So we'll not talk about that anymore. Well, your Minnetonka skippers try one step closer to that state title. <laughs> that's been one eluding step. you yep. this the year. That's I know that's we'll on everybody's see. mind. We'll see. Pretty busy weekend over here, kind of preparing. Tomorrow's a big day, or today, I guess, the day you're listening to the show. And our family is our, our oldest, and our son turns 18. So that's kind of weird to have an 18 year old in the house. And so I asked him, Troy, if tomorrow, like I said, you have two options you can pay rent or move out. He, he didn't think yep. that was a very funny joke. Yeah pay up bud or get out start start making it as a man <laughs> he thinks that he like what's more in his mind which is very common for an 18 year old is stuff like tattoos like that's where his brain is at oh so boy yeah a lot of kind of coaching to press the brakes a little bit uh and a lot of different regards like that so yeah. uh, we got a big show today it's our expo preview show by the time you're listening probably to our next episode we'll be in hockey card heaven at the toronto sport card expo so we got a lot planned to just on, on primers and especially information for people that have never been so i'm really excited about that but before we get going just a reminder that the hockey cards gong show podcast is a patreon podcast that means we rely on support from listeners like yourself to help us cover our show expenses produce more and hopefully better hockey card content and help us fund initiatives even in a small way to grow the hockey hobby it's super easy to support us. You can join our out of 199 support level tier. It starts at $5 a month. Not only do you support the show, you get access to our Gong Show Discord. We do a lot of kind of fun stuff through there. Uh, get to chat with us every day. Get priority for uh, asking our interview guest questions or mailbag, stuff like that. It's very easy to do. You go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com, and click on the Become a Patron link at the top of the page. Or you go to the Patreon website directly at patreon.com and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. There's a link in the show description if you're listening to us on a podcast app or in the YouTube description if you're watching us on that platform. Also, there's a link via our link tree and our Instagram and TikTok profile. All right, Troy, you ready for the game plan, buddy? On today's show, we begin with the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 32. Next is off to Who's Hot and the Struggle Bus. Then we take a look at Hobby News, followed by our Fall Toronto Sport Card Expo Preview. Then we have new product releases, followed by our Gong Show Mailbag. And we end the show with personal pickups. Okay, Josh, I am trying to be pithy in my introduction mm. this time. We'll see how it goes. Previously, we looked at the greatest NHL player to wear each number that matched our episode number. We used the Hockey Writers' Greatest NHL Players to Wear Each Number article. For our second go-through, I'm selecting one of the runners-up from the article and dubbing that player the almost greatest NHL player to wear the number that matches our episode number. We are on episode number 132, so I will select the almost greatest NHL player to wear number two. And Josh, the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 32, per the nominees in the article, is Jonathan Quick. Goalie oh, time. We got goalie our time. of him last night here because he took on yeah. him for a while. <laughs> yeah, that was funny because I, I knew he was still playing, and I looked up the wild game, and I was like, oh, he is playing. He's in the game for for the Rangers. Yes, Jonathan Quick. Two, sorry, Troy, before we get into yeah. it. I think you did get about two lines of text reduced from your intro. I think so. Maybe that's the new game should be is <laughs> how many words can you make? If you get down to like four words yep. and you can communicate all that, I'll be super impressed. I'm going to keep taking words out every week until I <laughs> get where I want to be. Additional nominees at number 32 are Claude Lemieux and Murray Craven. And I was very tempted to do Claude Lemieux, Lemieux because he's one of those guys you, everyone hates unless he played on your team. 
And then I still think people hated him. As a reminder, the greatest to wear number 32 was another uh, big penalty minute guy, Dale Hunter. Mm-hmm. All right, Josh. Jonathan Quick, overview. Goalie, born in Milford, Connecticut, but raised in Hamden, Connecticut. So he's one of us. He's an American. Gotta Where do you up. rank him amongst American-born goalies? Oh, he's top, probably top five. Okay. He's up there in that discussion. Quick was drafted 72nd overall in the 2005 NHL entry draft by the Los Angeles Kings. Quick has played in 756 regular season NHL games over a current 17 season NHL career. Quick began his career playing over 16 seasons with the Los Angeles Kings. He then had a very short stint with the Vegas Golden Knights and currently plays for the New York Rangers as we kind of mentioned as the wild played the rangers last night and quick was the goalie yeah all right so his awards and accomplishments he is a three-time cup winner now i know he won it two times with the kings and then last year he was on vegas and he was i think a backup for a lot of it he played like 10 games but it's funny you look at some spots and they say he's a two-time cup winner and some say Mm three-time cup winner so i think people i don't know what the whole situation there is how why some only say two and some say three was he the backup in the finals i think he so i know i can't remember exactly how it happened but he was a backup for some point during the stanley cup playoffs i think he played 10 regular season games and then when people started their <laughs> vegas goalies just started falling i know he was a backup he never played but i know he was a backup during the stanley cup final or playoffs I can't remember where he came in or if he was made it all the way through the cup. Yeah, because Brossois, Brossois, Brossois. injured, and so is yep. Logan Thompson. Yep. And then they kind of rode Aiden Hill. Yep. Quick is a two-time Jennings Award winner, one-time Conn Smythe winner, one-time NHL second All-Star team selection, three-time NHL All-Star game selection. For no Vesnas. No Vesnas. He. That surprise you? surprises me because he had one awesome year that I think it was 2011, 12, where his con Smythe stat where he won the con Smythe and they won the Stanley cup. I think his stats are statistically the greatest a goal he's ever put up in the playoffs, like the modern day playoffs. I know his goals against was under two. I might mention it in a little bit, but that year, Henrik Lundqvist, Lund- I can't say his name, Lundqvist, won. Lundqvist or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Lundqvist, he won it. So King Hank, you think that's because he dresses better? That that Probably kind of... looks looks better. Quick's just kind of doesn't look as suave as as Quick's an everyman. Hank is, yeah. a, you know, <laughs> Hank's Hank, a gentleman. All right. Yeah, for his career, three hundred seventy-seven wins, two hundred seventy-seven losses, eighty-four ties, two point four six goals against average, point nine one one save percentage, fifty-nine shutouts. Quick has made the playoffs in eight of his previous sixteen NHL seasons. Compiling 49 wins, 43 losses, 2.31 goals against, 0.921 save percentage, and 10 shutouts in 93 playoff games played. For the best season of his NHL career, I'm going with the 2011-12 season where Quick capped the season with the Stanley Cup. For the 2011-12 season with the Kings, Quick had 35 wins, 21 losses, 13 ties, a 1.95 goals against average, and then 0.929 save percentage and tons, 10 shutouts in 69 games played. Like a bonehead, I didn't write his playoff stats, which I know were just insane. But, yeah, so no Vesna, but he definitely had a couple of really good seasons. Definitely was in the running for Vesna's a couple times. I have some so, breaking news, Troy. Uh-oh, what happened? Well, it's breaking news to us. It actually happened oh. like 11 years ago. The <laughs> 2012 Vesna finalists? As you you were correct in mentioning that Henrik Lundqvist was the winner. Yeah. The other two finalists were Jonathan Quick and your Pekka Rinne. Oh, I didn't know. I did read the app. I figured oh. I won't bring up Pekka too many times. Pekka was robbed. <laughs> Pekka, uh, he got, I think he got one best in his career. So Quick is synonymous with the LA Kings. He holds most every significant goaltending record for the Kings in the regular season and postseason. Quick is known as an aggressive goalie who challenges shooters and is very good at gaining depth to take away net. He's also a fantastic athlete 
and is very good at making I just I cringe when I say this at making quick changes in direction. It's really hard to say stuff about a goalie. His last name's Quick without using Quick in his name. Oh I yeah. Had, I just had to use it's no pun. It's not even a pun. I just now is Quick your jam? Like I know you're a goalie aficionado. You have opinions, which is a good thing. Yeah. On lots of goalies, like where does he fall on like the Troy's like list He's, of goalies? He falls on Troy's really good. He's a great goaltender when he wants to be. I know I've been to USA hockey clinics where they've shown video of quick saying, this is what we don't want. Cause wow. sometimes he can get, and it's not like 90% of the time. It's like a couple of times he can get ah, what's it, nonchalant and do mm-hmm. some things that you don't want young goaltenders to do. So they've actually used him as an example. However, that's only on very minor things. If I, Obviously, he's a great example to follow if you want to make the pros. <laughs> he works hard. He's a great athlete. Ha- has had a still going very good career. Yeah. So Quick is currently still playing in the NHL with the New York Rangers. This season, he has two wins, zero losses, zero ties, with a 1.42 goals against average, 0.948 save percentage, and one shutout in four games played. And he actually mentioned that he actually likes kind of being a backup. So it's like if you can get over the ego of not being a starter and want to be a backup in the NHL, you can have a continued long career even after playing 10 to 15 seasons because teams always need some backup to come in that's got good NHL experience. It's kind of like an NFL quarterback, too. That Yeah. You can be a backup for 12 years and not get sacked 50 times in a season. <laughs> yep. It's not a – well, especially backup NFL quarterbacks make like more than 10 million a year. So that's yeah. even a much better gig. I'm sure backup goalie makes what a million, two million a year, something like that. Oh, probably. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, somewhere around there, I'm sure. All right, for our fun, interesting facts, why does Jonathan Quick wear number 32? Well, that's the number the trainers gave him, and it's stuck. So that's. I think we've had that story more than once. Yeah. Not an, not an NHL stat, but still a fun one. On October 24th, 2007. Quick became the second goaltender, and I can't believe this happened twice, second goaltender in ECHL history to get his first win, first shutout, and score a goal in the same game. Wow. <laughs> That's nuts. And I can't happen twice. The odds got to be astronomical for that to happen. Quick is second all-time in NHL history for wins by an American-born goaltender with 377. And still counting, so he'll he'll probably have some more. In the 2000, oh here it is, in the 2011-12 Stanley Cup playoffs, Quick posted one of the best statistical lines of a goalie in playoff history. Quick had a record of 16 and four, with a 1.41 goals against and a .946 save percentage and three shutouts. Very Ottinger first round like a couple of years. Yeah. Ago. Ray and Mike's Deli in Hamden, Connecticut, named the Quick Witch Sandwich in Quick's honor after his 2012 Stanley Cup victory. That might be the greatest one there. Only on this show do you learn <laughs> only on this show do you find fun facts like this about knowledge. your favorite NHL players. So yeah, forget everything else I said. Just remember the sandwich part. Go to Ray and Mike's and get a Quick Witch. <laughs> there you go. All right, Jonathan Quick, rookie. It is a 2007. SP Authentic, number 177, Future Watch, serial numbered out of 999. No auto. You don't get no auto, Jonathan Quick. You just get no a young guns? Watch. No young guns. That'll never happen again. Now that Upper Deck <laughs> basically puts out 600 yeah. <laughs> young guns a year between Series 1, 2, yep. and Extended. Like, they do a young guns. If, like, you knew a guy that played in the NHL, you yeah. get a young guns. You, like, looked at the ice <laughs> while you are at the game. You get a young guns. You get a young guns. PSA 10 pop, Josh, of this card is 14. Wow. Gem rate, 38%. Last sale I could find was on March 2nd, 2021, via eBay.ca and verified in Terapeak for $651.81 US. Now, is there a part go. of you, like, in the cases with Quick and other players that don't have that young guns, does it bug you that they don't have like that same rookie card that almost every other player does? Or is there a part of you that thinks it's kind of cool and unique that they have sort of this oddball card? For I, 
I yes, I like that they don't have the young guns. That's kind of the oddball thing. However, I also don't like goalies on. I don't like the name young guns for goalies. I just think it doesn't match. Yeah. And I always wish they could have came up with something else. Now I get it. The young guns is the synonymous rookie card for every NHL player. Now I, but I do, I do like when they're not on a young guns for goalies and it's something else. Like what, like Tendy Baby or Boy? Or... <laughs> you know, I could probably sit for five hours and not come up with a good name, and then I'll just be like, well, maybe, she, maybe you just go back to Young Guns. Maybe that's an off-season content thing we'll do. Is we'll yeah. try to name the goalie Young Guns. <laughs> All right, Troy, another great report. It's awesome to learn about these players and uh, can definitely appreciate Jonathan Quick a little bit better. Yeah. I, I am glad we got to him a little bit last night because our Wild desperately yeah. needed a win, and I mean desperately <laughs> needed a win. Okay, it's time for Who's Hot in the Struggle Bus. My favorite parts about doing this show. We're nearing the end of week four already in the NHL season. What's what's happening? I know. So, so it's time for uh, another edition of Who's Hot and what's now become, I think, the global hockey community's favorite struggle bus, right? You hear about <laughs> it uh, almost everywhere. In Who's Hot, of course, we take a look at the three players from the past week and early season that are tearing it up, piling up the points, and generating some hobby hype. Then Troy and the struggle bus, well, it's the opposite. It's the players yeah. who are struggling and could use a long ride on a terribly noisy, smoky, and uncomfortable bus to find <laughs> their zen and hopefully turn things around. So here we go. Let's start as, as we always do with our picks for who's hot. So I had the first pick and had to go with my guy, Pasta, David Pasternak. Through his first 11 games played, he has nine goals, seven assists for 16 points. And remember last season, Troy, he finished with a mere 61 goals and 52 assists for 113 points and 82 games played. He's still just 27 years old, too. Doesn't it seem like he's been around forever? Like, it's impossible that this guy is 26. I do. I feel like he should be 38, 38 yeah. and have gray hair. And So I was kind of tabulating the numbers here a little bit. And if he can continue to play at an elite level until his mid-30s, which you'd think that there's a good chance of that happening. Mm-hmm. He could end up when it's all said and done being a 600 plus goal guy. Yeah. He's already got like in, so in 603 games played for his career, he has 310 goals, 320, 323 assists for 633 points. And you know, all that being said, and I don't think this next statement qualifies as breaking news, which would be twice in one show and just weird for us. <laughs> but uh, he's a uh, really good at hockey. Troy. Yes. And this is a guy that gets completely slept on on this hobby, too. It does not make a lot of sense to me at all, right? You look at, go back to his career numbers. He's north of a half a goal per game, north of a point per game, plays in an original six market with a fantastic fan base. You know, I was kind of grasping at straws today, trying to figure out, like, why he doesn't have more of a hobby chase. And maybe it's the fact that he hasn't won a cup. Even though, again, like you would assume he's older, and it's hard to wrap your head around that because Boston has won it a few times that Pasta has not won a Stanley Cup. Oh, and he, he's he got one Rocket Richard from the 2020 season, the 2019-20 season. That's kind of it in the trophy case for him. So I don't know. Maybe that's it. I, do you have, in your mind, how is this guy not a bigger hobby star? This could be, I don't know if this is a big thing, but he's Czechoslovakian, right? He's not Canadian or U.S., I don't Those see a lot of, well, yeah, but there's only room for one, one check and that's Yager. No, but I always <coughs> wonder if that plays into it. If uh, I don't know, I don't know what his personality is like. I haven't seen a lot of interviews with him. I don't know if he's very personable or, or what, but a Boston fan would probably know more about that than I did. But yeah, just kind of s- seems to always slip under the radar and score 60 goals. <laughs> so David Pasternak is a 2014 Young Guns. And his PSA 10, get this, population 188. <laughs> wow. But they print 100 of them, or like they printed like 1,000 and that's it? They said, I don't know. It. We're done. Shut it down. Last sold for 1,725 US on November 4th. Yeah. It's up 84% in the past three months, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. October 17th, right? Someone bought this card for 850 US. So the last sale wow. is 1725. And well, that's less than half what somebody paid. So I was a, a steal. Now we normally don't say, it's not even normally, we never say invest mm-hmm. really in a base young guns, 
But for a player like this at a pop 188, given I, I don't think that it's going to ever get to 2000 Yeah. at this point, this is one I would at least consider a investable base young guns. It might be yeah. at the top of the list. And that's that might be a fun exercise for us to go through at some point, too. Yeah, because then I mean, I assume that a pop is not going anywhere. It's no, not with what his career has done and where he's been and when this thing was printed. So, yeah, agree. It just seems like with all these like 2013, 2014 guys, when you look at their gem rates or their pop counts, I mean, and compared to the next year when McDavid's Young Guns came out, yeah, there must have been a massive difference in print in overall print runs between yeah. 2014 and 2015. Agree. All right, Troy, you got the next guy. And who's hot? I do, and I'm disappointed because I think we've used this picture before, so I'm sad. I always try to find different pictures, but I couldn't find that many good ones. And I it's not like I looked for an hour, but Quinn Hughes, Josh, he has been a beast to start this season. So when I was doing my research, I so I put the past week ending November 3rd. Quinn had one goal at seven assists for eight points in two games. On the season, Hughes has four goals, 12 assists for 16 points in 10 games played. Wow. His, yeah, his 16 points puts him tied for sixth in points this season in the NHL at first among defensemen. So it's funny. We're talking about another, our different Hughes brother, not, not brother Luke, not brother Jack. We got Quinn Hughes. Well, brother Jack has 20 points, and that's going to stay there. We'll get into that in yeah, a little bit. But, but put a pin in it. Put a pin in it. We're going to have that come back. But to have a, two brothers, one with 20 points and one with 16, yeah. is kind of mind-blowing. It is. Good genes in that family. So Quinn Hughes has some pretty stellar rate metrics so far. Uh, when I was doing my research, I kind of looked some of these up. He is averaging four points per 60 minutes played. That's pretty good. Yeah. And while I'm not a huge plus-minus guy... Quinn currently sits at plus 13, which is pretty good so early in the season. Plus, he is always out there against the best players from the other team. So I will give some credence to a plus 13 this early in the season. That's pretty amazing, too. He is also on pace for 131 points, which, again, is pretty nutty. Obviously, there's a 99% chance he doesn't get that many points, but it still shows just how hot this guy has been to start the season. Hughes is one of the best and smartest defenders in the game. And I went digging on him a little bit. And there was a recent article by The Athletic, who doesn't sponsor us, but should. I think it's very obvious that Quinn Hughes knows where he sits in rankings that are put out by some publications. Because guess what? He's not at the top usually. He's always yeah. kind of down a little. And I think, I think he's got a chip out of his shoulder. <laughs> I don't think he likes it very much. Because there's interviews with them, and he's like, yeah, I know where I sit in those rankings. And so this season, it's not he's not only putting up points, but he's also just been a terrific defender. He's been stripping opponents of the puck on a regular basis. And you read anything from the Vancouver beat writers on his performance. It's just been amazing. He's also stated he obviously is aware of his offensive defense and mo defensive moniker, and he wants to also be known for his defensive ability as well. So I'll say this. If he – Continues to play like this. He's definitely on his way to being in the Norris conversation for sure. So Quinn Hughes is a 2019. Did I pull it up? Yep. It's a 2019 Young Guns. PSA 10 pop is 1,896 with a 63% gem rate. I think the last time we brought up his Young Guns was maybe three weeks ago. I, I went digging and it was at like, 1700 so it's jumped up almost 200 wow. by in just that month or month and a half maybe maybe not that much but it's it's definitely jumped a little again 63 percent gem rate the card sells it seems to hop around from 140 to 200 us range fairly regularly and beginning of october this card was going for around 120 us dollars so little, little good jump there. Again, Quinn Hughes off to a fantastic start. Offensive defenseman. So always be wary of that, that he is a D-man. Much more of an assist guy than a goal scorer. Yes, definitely assist assist machine. All right, Troy, for our final player to highlight in who's hot, we're going to stick with the Vancouver Canucks and go with Elias Pettersson, who's currently tied with Jack Hughes for the NHL points lead 
this season with six goals, 14 assists for 20 points in 11 games played. So would you say that the now the 8-2-1 and one Canucks, are, they got to be the surprise of the NHL season so far. They definitely were a train wreck last yeah, year. Definitely surprised me. Rick Tockett must know what he's doing. Yeah, he's done a phenomenal job yeah. since <laughs> taking over in mid-year last season. And so, Troy, if you go back to last year and you add last season stats onto his first 11 games this year, he now has 45 goals, 77 assists for 122 wow. points in his last 91 games played. It sort of feels to me like he's teetering on superstar status here. And kind of my, my question to you is, do you think that he, so we've had the kind of Jack Hughes breakout already this year, and that's maybe lost a little bit of steam with his injury that we'll get into soon. Yeah. Is Pedersen in your mind, maybe the most logical candidate to be the next hobby breakout star? I'll say it seems like it from looking at our discord and messages we get, I feel like Pedersen's name comes up a lot more than it used to. And I think people are finally taking notice of this guy because he seemed to be buried a little bit in Vancouver, but now you can't ignore what he's doing. It's phenomenal. Yeah. When we talked about him a few weeks ago, the fact that yeah. he's like bulked up, got more, much more physical. Yep. Aside from Malkin, he leads the lead in stick flex, <laughs> which is very look at the flex if you want. Look, look at that, baby. I had, to, had to pick Ooh. that photo. <laughs> His team is winning, so I think that factors in. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that he could be the next breakout. But but there's a part of me too that wonders if he's like a, in the posture not category. If he's just one of those guys that nobody can really ever explain why, but just doesn't seem to latch on with with uh, with the hobby. So, yeah, we're going to check in on his hobby market, Troy, and we're going to play one of our favorite games. Ready for <laughs> it? It's called Does Anybody Care? I love it. We're going to see if the hobby has responded to Elias Pedersen's hot start. So Pedersen is a 2018 Young Guns, PSA 10, pop 2,137, a mere 77% <laughs> gem rate. Last sold for 215 US dollars on November 4th. Now, here's indication one of does the hobby care it is up 60 percent in the past two weeks which is interesting so the card was selling about 162 us right at the start of the season you would hope I think that this card would be up that that to me shows the that looks like the hobby cares 215 is healthy for those oh, yeah. for those pop and gem rate numbers very healthy now let's look at more like the higher end market okay so in the past month Three Pedersen cards have sold for more than a thousand US, with the top sale being thirty three hundred ninety two US dollars for one of his twenty eighteen the Cup RPA at a ninety nine, which is BGS nine ten. Mm-hmm. So that's one of three for over a thousand. There's been a total of eight sales in the past month for more than five hundred US dollars. Now, if you compare that to a year ago, he had one sale of greater than a thousand US and four total sales for more than five hundred. So the hobby is heating up a bit. It's, I would call maybe a slow boil at this point. Nothing <laughs> scorched earth like we saw with Jack Hughes over the past month, where it's like record here, record there, three times 4x kind of stuff. But yeah, I, so I would, you know, in our favorite game, does that, does anybody care? So you're uh, saying say the hobby Pet- does care a little bit. I was saying, you're saying Pedersen's a hot dog. The water's slowly boiling <laughs> to make the hot dog ready. I got it. Yeah, there you go. So we'll see where it goes. All right, Troy. There it is. Uh, Struggle bus is pulled up, and I hope the shocks are uh, <laughs> in good working order because we're going to fill it up. Well, this, if you watch uh, on YouTube, sure. we got to get that license plate fixed. Yeah, uh, definitely. So we're going to start the struggle bus this week with uh, our guy, uh, Maddie Beniers. And we briefly mentioned him at the start of yep. the season. Like we were like two or three games in and we tried to make like a half-hearted attempt to <laughs> glance at players that were off to slow start. Yeah. But we didn't want to like put him on the struggle bus. But at this point, we just have to. In 12 games now, he has zero goals, four assists for, yeah, four points. That puts him on pace of, uh, well, still zero goals and 27 <laughs> assists for the season. So I'm going to step out on a limb here and say that's not great for your reigning Calder Trophy winner and no. really the face of the 2022-23 hobby class. 
it's not going to do much, Troy, to pump up those 2022-23 releases. That keep I'm going to be buying those releases for about $40 a box. I'm telling you that. Last season in his, in his rookie year, which, again, he won the call the trophy, he put up 24 goals, added 33 assists for 57 points and 80 games played for the upstart Seattle Kraken. So when I was thinking about him and his start, you being a coach, I was kind of curious if the notion of a sophomore slump, is that a real thing in your mind? Yeah, he, yes and no. It just depends on the player. Yes, I mean, you can find any example. I could say there's junior slumps or, <laughs> or senior sure. slumps after three years, four years, et cetera. It, yes, I think it is a real thing, but I, I could find you tons of examples of it. And is there one thing that typically causes this, or is it just like an individual thing? Like it's how we can... totally individual. It could be overconfidence. Could be just puck luck. Could be everything was bouncing their way, and now variance has reared its ugly head and brought you back to where you're supposed to be. There's a bunch of stuff that can go on. Well, I'm not the hockey analytics mind you are, but I did find some data that I'm really excited to run by you and see if maybe you think this is part of the problem because it stood out to me. So I think part of the issue looks like his shooting and more so how many shots he's getting. He only has 20 shots in 12 games. Not good. Okay, so you agree that that's concerning. Concerning, especially for my guy many... that's he's supposed to be a goal scorer. I need him to have more than whatever that average is out to one point something. Yeah, I don't know how many 40, 50 goal scorers get less than two shots per game. Yeah. So I, I did a couple comparisons. Austin Matthews has 51 shots in 11 games. Yeah. Quinn Hughes, who we, you just talked about, rarely scores, scores, gets a lot of points, <laughs> rarely score, he has, scores goals. He has 40 shots in 11 games. And here we have Beniers with 20. So uh, that's probably a big part of the issue there. Interesting, though, too, when I was researching him for the struggle bus, you, you'll normally see, like, if you go do, like, a Google News kind of player search, you'll see a yeah. bunch of articles that speculate, like, why they're off to slow start. There really isn't that hype or that buzz yet for him. So I don't know, I, you know, maybe he's just 21 needs a bit more time to get acclimated into the season, but it's a pretty concerning start at all. And the season's already flying by. What is 12 games? 15% of the year or something like that, then he doesn't have a goal. Well, he, uh, he better step it up or else those, uh, what in about three years when the 22, 23 cup comes out, <laughs> those boxes might be pretty cheap if we can't get these rookies to do something. Marco Rossi, Troy, might be leading the class. He might be. He might be the guy. Yeah, you never know. Maddie Beniers is a 2022-23 Young Guns. His PSA 10 popped 1,068, 32% gem rate. Less over 126 U.S. on November 2nd. It is down about 21% in the past two weeks. Well, from one rookie to another in the 2022-23 class, you got the next guy. So I I didn't even know why I did this guy, because now i got to say his name. I can't say... Was it Juraj Slavkovsky? So I always want to say, see, I always want to put, I want to get rid of that V. Slavkovsky. Slavkovsky. So I do know who he is, but so I am going to preface this. This might be a shortstop for our boy as things have switched up a bit in Montreal and changes recently made by Montreal might propel Slavkovsky to jump off the struggle bus at the next stop. I don't think we've had actually someone jump off while the struggle bus has been going down the road, but he might be one. I will get, well, as Josh likes to say, put a pin in that for a sec. Yep. So up until Saturday night, Slavkovsky had zero goals, one assist for a measly one point in 10 games played, Josh. Things were just not clicking for him. He was averaging 14 minutes of ice time, which is a decent amount. You can definitely do some damage with 14 minutes. But again, things were not clicking with him. He didn't look confident on the ice. Even when he got power play time, he didn't look comfortable. He was not getting shots at all. His feet were always moving when he was shooting, like on on plays where they're feeding him one-timers, where he had plenty of time to set himself. It just it looked like his game was struggling and something was going on. And, in fact, things were getting so bad that fans and you get the rumblings from the press, but some in the front office were wondering – if Slavkovsky should be sent to the AHL. That's not good. You don't want that for this guy. And with all that said, last game, the Canadians made a switch. 
they moved Slavkovsky to the first line with Caulfield and Suzuki. And, of course, what does he do? He responds with a power play goal. And if you saw it, it was absolutely gorgeous. He comes in, does this. I don't know. He almost put the stick or the puck up on his stick and did some little flick over the goalie's shoulder. It was pretty amazing. But he was getting shots. I think he had three or four shots in the game. And there's a lot of buzz around him being moved to with Suzuki and Caulfield to kind of up his game. And so if he continues with them, it'll be very interesting to see how he does with Caulfield and Suzuki. However, for now, he's landed on the struggle bus. You can't get one point <laughs> being a number one pick in 10 games played and not find yourself a nice warm seat. But he might be jumping off soon. So Slavkowski is a 2022 Young Guns, Josh. PSA 10 has a pop of 320 with a 32% gem rate. Sells for around 180 US dollars. It's sta- it's been pretty stable around there. I found some sales for lower, but those couldn't be verified in therapy. So I, they were a couple of goofy ones here and there for like $80. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. If you looked at another reporting tool, but once you went to therapy, they weren't paid for. That's He's almost had like no hype, even since he was been drafted. Like, yeah, it's well, the injury just kind of put a big damper in it last year. He was terrible then, though before the injury. Too. Yeah, true. I just imagine what his hobby market would be like if he oh. played for Nashville or yeah. Arizona or something like that. Did you see the Coyotes' social media account? No, they are savage. They are absolutely savage. So there's a oh, meme really? going around with Vince McMahon. And yeah. it's like he gets asked an interview question, and McMahon just shakes his head, like, like cut the cameras off. He's waving his hands, turn off the cameras. Well, the Coyotes media social media account put out <laughs> when you what was it when you when you don't draft Slavkowski number one or whatever, or you draft Logan Cooley oh. at not number one or something. It's just it was just yeah. hilarious. Like it was savage, but it was great. I love it. Well, hopefully, he turns it around. Because it would be good oh, yeah. to have him play well, especially in that market, and of course for the hobby. Well, we normally only do two players in the struggle <laughs> bus because we want to keep it yeah. as comfortable as possible. But we had no choice yep. this week to go for it, and it's not just a player, Troy. We are for I think it's a gong show first. We're putting an entire organization on the struggle bus <laughs> in the San Jose Sharks. Yeah, they're brutal. And this could be the most struggle bus worthy nomination in the history of our show because they are brutal. And <laughs> it's a good thing we added some extra seating this summer because yep. again, a whole organization goes uh, is coming on board. So I found this a couple days ago, Troy, on the Full Send Hockey Instagram account. Yeah, this is pretty good, and it ties into like Quinn uh, Hughes a little bit and brother uh, Jack and brother Luke. So. I think like as of like Friday or Thursday, Jack Quinn and Luke Hughes at the time at 41 combined points versus 24 for the entire Sharks <laughs> roster. Yikes. That's not good. Then you look at the Sharks last two games. So on Thursday, which was November 2nd, they lost to the Knucks 10 to 1. Maybe that's why we part of why the reason why we had Pedersen and Hughes on the yeah. spot, they <laughs> played the Sharks. Yeah, they got One a times they played the Sharks this year. We have to look into that. Yeah. So they followed that up on Saturday, Troy, losing 10 to 2 to the Penguins. Those are like bad baseball scores. Hey, let helps alone, my, help my fantasy team because I had Crosby. That's only the fourth time in NHL history that a team has given up 10 goals in back to back games. And they're a minus, I think, this is as of today, which is Sunday, of course. They're minus 42 gold differential through the first 11 games of the year is a NHL all-time worst. Yeah, they've scored 12 goals in 11 games, and they've given up 56 now. So maybe that stat was even old. Uh, Oh, and yeah, as I, I buried the whole lead on this, they haven't won. So I think that's one more amazing. loss, yeah. and that's the all-time NHL mark for futility to start the season. So the a lot of questions, but is the key one now, are we witnessing possibly the worst NHL team of all time? It better win. And a lot of rumblings about head coach Dan Quinn losing his job after the 
first dozen games. I mean, when you're losing, when you're giving up 10 goals a game, at some point you're going to have to make changes, right? You can't yeah. just go on. Well, part of it too, who, who, I mean, the general manager's got to take some fault for this too. He put together this team. I know that everyone wants to blame the coach, but the GM needs to take a good look in the mirror himself as well. Maybe Dan Quinn's the GM, if that's the case. Yeah. I don't know if he is, but I'll try to find that right now. So in somewhat of a miracle, actually, Tomas Hurdle, Troy has seven points on the season. Now, for a team that's only scored 12 goals, to have one guy with seven points is pretty impressive. Now, he only has one goal, but he's been involved in almost every one of their, every one of their goals to date. If you're wondering, too, Fabian Zetterlin leads the team with three goals on the year. And we normally tie in the hockey hobby here, but as hockey cards go, I honestly didn't even look. We all know, right? The only real hobby hope for the Sharks this year is William Eklund. Yep. And this team is so far in the dumps right now that <laughs> I guess he'd be a decent buy. But he's been off to a slow start, too. He's got one goal and one assist in 11 games, which isn't awesome. For It's kind of in Slavkovsky territory a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, uh Mike maybe Greer. you should Mike Greer is the current GM. Really? Yeah. Current. It's probably the <laughs> the best word for uh, so I don't know, Troy. What, what do you think should happen? Or do you think you should take over as head coach and yeah, write yeah. the ship in, in San Jose? <laughs> well, I'm telling you, if they keep going another week without winning games, some people gotta get fired. You just you gotta do something to look like you care. You just can't have this. You can't have a pro team zero losses, especially in the NHL. I know. I remember when I was a kid, I think, or I think the Orioles one time, Baltimore Orioles had an 0 and 18, maybe 0 and 21, somewhere in their start. I remember that there was like a Sports Illustrated cover, the player with his bat or helmet or his whatever head on the bat, looking all depressed in the locker room. And I'm sure they probably beat the Twins to get their first win because that's how it probably I came to know about it. Well, just as bad as or as bad as we think at times it is for the Wild. At least we're not the <laughs> no, at least we're not the Sharks. That's who's hot in the struggle bus for week four in the NHL season. So again, on who's hot, we featured David Posternock, Quinn Hughes, and Elias Pedersen. And then on the struggle bus, Maddie Beniers, Yuraj Slavkovsky, and anyone and everyone affiliated with the San Jose. <laughs> Whole stinking organization. Got to make a quick mention for Gong Show partner and sponsor Slab Sharks. Of course, thank you to them for their support of the show. The current Slab Sharks weekly eBay auction is live. And they followed up last week's banger. I think it was the biggest one ever with another incredible auction. Mm -hmm. So make sure you head to slapsharks.com for a link to the current auction. Check out all the awesome hockey cards and, of course, place your bids. So on Saturday, Troy, I spent some time looking through the auction and found these incredible options available to bid on right now. So I just want to highlight a few of them. Love doing this. So here's a super big card. A 2015 Upper Deck Connor McDavid Young Guns Silver Foil EGS 9.5. So what is it? You have to burn five base young guns. <laughs> I don't. Uh, was it? Has that always been the same? I've always wondered. Like, what was it in 2015? Was it the same? I don't know. Maybe. But, yeah, that's a commitment. Yeah, to, these aren't easy to put together. I'll tell you that. Be really interesting to see kind of how much this one goes for. Then there's a really nice 2020 21 SP Authentic Kim Stutzla Future Auto out of 999. He's off to a pretty decent start to the yep. season as well. Speaking of future watch autos, Troy, it did not take long for some of the newest crop from 2022-23 to make it to the Slab Sharks auction. There's the 2022-23 SP Authentic Maddie Beneers future watch auto out of $9.99. Then we got to go with our boy Kirill. Big card for him. 2020-21 OPG Platinum Rookie Auto Seismic Gold out of 25. His market's down a lot. So, I like, yeah. gosh, what, two years ago, this card would have been utterly unaffordable. Yes. And now if you're a Kirill fan, you can pick this stuff up, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. Then there's another kind of awesome McDavid card in the auction. It's a 2021-22 SPX Finite Achievement die cut. Yeah, I've never seen this. Auto this is something I've never seen. Have you seen one of these before? Like, no, I haven't. And there's actually oh. a bunch. So I think somebody is unloading them okay. in the Slap Sharks auction. So if you want to look at a bunch of options, go look. And what I think is really interesting about this is – in general, I don't feel like I, and I look at a lot of sales, probably more so than most people. You never see these like bounty achievement cards. Yeah. So it is kind of, kind of neat to see them 
in the flesh. Because <laughs> once people do the math, they're like, huh, well, <laughs> I'm never going to get back what I put in to get this card. So I'll just keep This it. card costs the <laughs> Bounty Redeemer $68,000. Yeah. So you're probably going to get a really good deal based on that. Again, these are just some of the few awesome hockey cards available. Be sure to head to SlabSharks.com for a link to the auction. Check them out for yourself. Also, try some huge news this week from Slab Sharks. I think by the end of yeah. this month, end of November, they're launching a new website and portal that yep. will allow you to manage your auctions through them and check out the progress of your submissions. I know they're investing quite a bit into the entire consigner experience. So that's very important to them. They want to make sure that when you consign with them, that it's easy and you have all the information you need at your fingertips. So again, check out SlabSharks.com for complete consignment information, including payout rates and to get started consigning your cards with them today and they're still doing the bedard thing yeah 98 percent payout and all bedard happy news happy news okay we've alluded to this now about 17 times <laughs> so yeah. we'll we'll get to jack hughes injury news yeah uh, it's never fantastic when your hobby breakout star gets injured mid breakout mid yeah. hobby breakout try that's a little bit of a buzzkill hughes left the devil's 4-1 loss against the st louis blues in the first period Friday night with a quote-unquote upper body injury. I saw an update on Saturday. I, I didn't notice it, see anything today. Maybe you've seen something. But Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman reported Saturday night on Hockey Night in Canada and X. got so irritating. I so just wish they called it Twitter. That there's no official update on Hughes, but the word is that, thankfully, a worst-case scenario has been avoided. He will miss some time, but it's not as bad as it could have been. So I assume by worst case scenario that that would be like season ending yep. injury or something. Yep. Season ending is what I think. And I've heard the same thing as well. And it's starting to hit a bunch of other reports, reporters saying it's he's out, but it's not, it's not what they feared. Maybe like how Matt Boldy was out for eight games or something like yeah. that. Do you know what he, what he got injured? Did you see the hit? Or, I like, didn't shoulder? see the hit. I didn't see any of the hit or what it, I didn't know what actually he injured. <laughs> yeah. Well, he uses a 2019 young guns, PSA 10 pop only 4,029, <laughs> 75% gem rate. Yeah. That's over three eighty five on November 3rd. It's up about 8% in the past two weeks has been coming down a bit. It peaked on October 29th at 443 us dollars. Nice. That's crazy. Yeah. All right, Troy, the other story we want to get to in hobby news is Gemrate.com has released yep. its grading summary for October 2023. It's always interesting to check in, see how many cards are graded, what types of cards are being sent to all the major grading companies, and, and their sort of battle for market share. Yep. How are they doing against each other? And it's just also, I guess, another indicator of hobby trends and health a little yep. bit too. So I'm looking at total cards submitted. So this includes actually both sports cards and TCG. PSA... Leads away again with 1.2 million cards, which it's crazy to think how they get through that. How many people does it take to get through that many cards in a month? How many very rushly hired people does it take oh, to get yeah. through those cards? <laughs> that's what, that's my worry. CGC made a big jump last month with 272,000 yeah. cards graded, but we're going to put a pin in that. It's a very interesting note about that. SGC was third at the 129,000 cards graded. And BGS fourth with 75,000 total cards graded. While PSA was down 1% month over month, up 15% year over year, S or CGC, SGC, and BGS all had very nice month over month and year mm -hmm. over year increases. So that's a little bit of good news there. Now, if you just look at sports cards graded, which is in our next slide, first you can see how many TCG, TCG cards are being graded now. It's about the same as sports cards. So basically the numbers are like cut in half with the exception of CGC. And that's the most interesting note. So while they had a huge spike last month um, in total cards graded, went up to 272,000. Only 6.25% of those cards, Troy, are sports cards. Am I on so the I wrong mean, slide? In, Sorry, I apologize. No, no, no you are. Side. Okay. Yeah, I'm just comparing. So if you look at CGC at 17,000, gotcha. yeah, their gotcha. total... Then it which includes TCG. How many yes. three letter words can I? I it this one thing about this hobby that bugs me to no end is the whole driving acronym. myself crazy. <laughs> so only six point two five percent of the cards that they graded were sports cards. Gotcha. And that was a huge dip. That's sixty nine percent less than sports yeah. cards. Yeah, 
Gotcha. So it's kind of the tale of two stories for them. Big increase yeah. on the trading card game side. Yeah. But a massive decrease on the sports side. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe we should have put CGC on the struggle bus too. Yeah, maybe. Bus ain't that big. So <laughs> now looking at quickly at the category breakdown, not a heavy month last month for hockey cards. Normally it's above soccer, but actually fell below soccer last month. So PSA graded 23,700 hockey cards down 15% month over month. SGC graded 3,600 hockey cards, which is, I think, flat. BGS graded 1,800 hockey cards down 11% month over month. So again, a lot of people will point to and still want to make the PSA and Beckett comparisons, but Beckett is, what, 12 or 13, 14 times less smaller than yeah. PSA and a hockey I mean, that's a significant difference. And CGC only graded 700 hockey cards. <laughs> that's kind of funny. And they so were all at, and they were all Jack Hughes. <laughs> 699 of them were Jack Hughes. So if you go back and you They're look legit. at the, to- the total amount of cards graded in last October, only 2.5% were hockey cards. Hmm. Now, as a comparison, 25.8% of cards graded last month were baseball cards. So hockey is, remains to be pretty small. Now, there could be a lot of theories for that. Obviously, the, the hobby itself is a little yeah. smaller. People always point to on the hockey side, well, it's more collector-driven, and collectors don't necessarily need to grade, that it's harder to get your cards good cards graded in Canada, especially with not wanting to ship them over the border. But I don't know. Anything jump out to you in this report? No, it's about what I expected. Nothing, Nothing worries me. Nothing... Just seems. I mean, I guess I don't like seeing soccer above hockey, but yeah. that's happened before. We've seen them kind of flip flop down in that fourth to fifth place. Okay, we're ready to roll into our Toronto Sport Card Expo Fall Expo preview. Mikey Singer is well. We're now just a few days away from the Fall Sport Card Expo. It happens this week. Definitely one of the highlights of the year, I think, for anyone in the hockey hobby. And like we've mm-hmm. done in the past. We want to kick off our coverage of the expo by talking to one of the key men that really makes it all happen. And that's Mikey Singer and his company that really run the logistics of the show and manage it. Mikey is a super nice guy. I really enjoyed our conversation with him regarding the fall expo and everything they have planned. So we're going to roll that interview now and, and hope you guys enjoy as well. All right. We're excited to have back on the show. Mikey Singer from the Toronto Sport Card Expo as part of our uh, Expo preview episode and no better person to have on. So welcome back, Mikey. Great to have you on again. Thank you for having me. Chose the worst possible time to drink a drink of water, (laughs) but uh, it's great to be back here. Well, now that's my sport is I'm going to try to completely (laughs) catch you when you're sneaking a drink in. (laughs) So for someone who's not, hasn't maybe caught your conversations on our show before or heard you somewhere else, maybe describe what your role with the Expo is. So my role and my team's role is to help the owner of the show run the event. So we'll be there running everything from the front door to the auto area to making sure all of you content creators are up on the stage, <laughs> giving our, our attendees amazing content, making sure the streamings happen. So a lot of the guts of the show. And for someone that's never been to the expo, how would you describe it to a collector? The largest show in North America that isn't named the national. <laughs> okay, that's a good start. <laughs> it, it it compromises it's it encompasses over almost two hundred thousand square feet now. Uh, it is insanely large with up to five hundred vendors. Uh, this show itself is going to be the largest one yet. Hmm. Uh, we say that every I swear I said the same <laughs> thing last time, but every single we added on a full extra hall. Uh, and the reason we did that is for the first time ever, we have a full grading pavilion. Um, and okay. inside that grading pavilion, PSA will be grading on site for the first time ever outside of the national. So it's a really big deal. They're sending up a massive team. Beckett uh, is also grading on site. Uh, Tag will be there. And then the regular is Mint, KSA. So we've got a, a huge uh, push to the grading and authentication. 
Uh, and, and again, with Beckett doing it last year and then PSA this year, it's a real opportunity for Canadians and, and, and people from the U.S., right? Like if you have a high-end card and you may not feel comfortable sending it across via email, or not email, via mail, um, this is your opportunity to hand it to someone and have it back by that day or, or yeah. that uh, end of the weekend. So it's a, it's a real advantage. Obviously, there's a little bit more of a cost to that. But again, when we're talking about things that cost, you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 can be really worth it. Or, or conversely, if you just want to grade stuff and then get it out on the floor, maybe swap, sell, uh, it's an opportunity to do so as well. I hadn't realized the benefit of, uh, of on-site grading until someone had explained that to me. And I think especially from the Canadian perspective, when mm -hmm. and it's more true when we're looking at hockey cards, there's so many very, very big hockey cards that are in Canadians' collections that, uh, and I think particularly with, with PSA to be in US-based, where it's pretty scary <laughs> to it just is. plop that card in a box and, no. and hand it off at the post office and assume that it's going to get to the grading company and get back to you. Like Troy and I have talked before where we're like, if we ever hit like a super, super big card, like a five, six figure card, we would fly to PSA <laughs> and sit there and wait for it or whoever we chose to get it graded with as, as opposed to, you know, not to be mean to the post office, but <laughs> they've had their issues. Yeah. I mean, it's a risk. Right, like it is out of your hands. It is not in PSA's hands. You're watching it in the tracking, and there's not really much you can do. And God forbid it gets lost, it's gone. Right, and there's only so much insurance will cover. And if that's a one of one or something like that, it doesn't matter because you can't get that back. Um, so you know, even during the pandemic, actually, me, me and Steve, me and Steve worked with a couple of high end collectors here, and Steve would actually like go down with the briefcase attached to his arm and hand it directly to PSA and then fly it back. Um, but now we won't have to do that. It's going to be much easier. They're going to be right there. And as you said, Josh, you don't have to worry. You drop it in, drop that card off. And by the end of the weekend or the end of the day, you'll have it back in your hand. What was it about now that convinced them to take that step and to invest more into coming to the expo? We've had PSA Canada in the show, and I think they're seeing the amount of submissions. Right. Like when you see okay. the volume of business that's coming there, it made sense for them. We're also, as I said, the second largest show in North America. So for them, this is an opportunity to get across the border, get a ton of submissions from people. Again, like we're saying, are not going to be comfortable sending it across in the mail. And, um, you know, there's a lot of the cup and things like that that are just they're almost too valuable to send out. Yeah. And I want to take maybe a little bit step back to to kind of maybe a bit of the bigger picture for especially people in the U.S. that maybe aren't aware of the expo or haven't been there, but love hockey cards and love the hockey hobby like we do. In addition to being the second largest show in North America, it's also very, very special from a hockey perspective, especially compared to the national. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're in Canada. So sure. hockey being a religion as much as it's a <laughs> national pastime. So you're going to see the best hockey cards that are in the market, right? And uh, you're going to see the best variety, uh, the best level. You'll see really some grails out there, uh, whether it's a Bobby Orr rookie, whether it's a, a Gretzky high grade rookie, or, or some of the newer ones like the Connor McDavid rookie, the cup. You'll see all of it at the show, uh, you know, anything. And, and I shouldn't just say those, but you'll find the more young guns, right? Like if hockey's your thing, you'll find everything from the dollars up to the million dollars. Yep. And I think that that is a point that's worth hanging around a little bit too, especially again for the American audience, because we're so used to every show we go here, if there's a hundred tables on average there's two hockey tables <laughs> or even at the national there was i was very... gonna say i was at the national and there was like three people who had hockey at their table and they're like oh, i've got hockey and sure enough <laughs> one of them was canadian yeah. um so yeah it was a rarity to see and that was, that shows huge so it just i i understand the frustration for the americans who are searching for hockey who do collect hockey trying to find it 
and, and now conversely, the expo feels like I don't know what the real percentage is, but it feels like it's 80 percent hockey. Is that kind of fair or is that overstated? I, I think it's a, it used to be right. It used to be far more hockey, but basketball and baseball still have a big home here. I'd say it's like yeah. 65, 70 percent hockey. And then on top of that, upper deck is here in a massive wow. way. They've yeah. got tons of diamond deal, like certified diamond dealers here. They do great stuff there with the redemptions. A lot of people breaking boxes. This this past show, they added uh, a two level uh, a two level booth. They have the upper deck in the upper deck booth, uh, <laughs> which is really cool. And it's and it's honestly it's where they show out the most, right? If you look at what they do in the National or Burbank or places like that, it's they're definitely there. But in Toronto, at this show, they come out in a really big way. And, and the second part to that is we also plan this show around the Hockey Hall of Fame inductions. Mm -hmm. And we'll get more into that as we look at our guest list and how amazing it is. But, you know, that's where it really, you know, they, they really jive together. Um, and, and like I said, you, you can't miss hockey on our show floor. Yeah, so that's the part that blew my mind so this will be our third expo mm -hmm. our first was the fall of last year and there's just nothing to compare to it from the perspective of and i know you've been to lots of card shows in the u.s too and so i think that's one of the things that we'd love to stress to any american collector that has considered going to the expo is number one it'll blow your mind and then number two if hockey is kind of your sole thing it's the analogy i give is like flying in first class it, it kind of ruins all other shows <laughs> here in the u.s once you go because it really is it's not even close there's no an analogy to it, it it's just uh it, it's very very unique from the person i know there's probably similar shows in canada but again just coming at it from the american perspective I mean, similar in the same way that, you know, any show will definitely have more hockey in Canada, but there is nothing like this. And we talked about this, Josh, your, your local card show won't compare, right? Like it, yeah. it, and it's hard to uh, understandably, right? There's, there's very few shows that are on the same level as this. Maybe the Dallas card show, uh, Chantilly used to be. Uh, but has shrunk over the last mm -hmm. little bit. But um, there's very few card shows of this size. How many years have you worked with the Expo now, personally? Uh, 2018 was the first show I did. In spring of 2018 was the first show I worked with them. So I couldn't tell you how many shows. Day. Two shows a year, plus we've added shows. So it's like... Yeah. Now up to four shows a year, we're working together and he's always looking to do more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably been like almost 20 shows now. Okay. How, how have you seen it evolve or what's been the biggest evolution? Would you say uh, there, in your there's mind? two, two major, like a couple major ones. So obviously growth, um, you know, as I said before, the show has grown immensely in 2018 when we shut it down right before the pandemic. We never stopped. We actually did three shows virtual. The first one we did had 12,000 people online. It was madness. Um, yeah, it was, it was really good. And the show then was in Hall 5 alone. And it was just about filling it up, but it wasn't totally full. And then we came back from the pandemic, and all of a sudden we're adding additional halls and additional areas. Um, the other big thing is, we focused on uh, really adding a lot more content. So the stage has been a big feature of ours. Adding to the the, the show app itself uh, is another big thing that we're trying to do. So continue to grow, grow that community and continue to have people talk with each other throughout the year um, and just different ways for them to connect. And then finally, the, the corporate involvement in the show itself, um, you know, eBay is our title sponsor. They're amazing. They come with a ton of value for our audience. Uh, they're setting up some really cool stuff this year. I don't want to. I don't want to tell anyone. I don't want to give away their <laughs> secrets. But they're going to have a really interesting booth. Um, we've obviously had greater exposure from people like. 
PWCC and uh, and now Heritage is taking a, a much larger presence inside the show. So things like that have really added to the value. And even, even some Canadian brands like Slab Sharks and stuff have really stepped up their game. Far more interactive. The last thing that I would say the changes, there's so many more kids on the floor. I would say in terms of the growth of the audience, that has grown exponentially uh, over the time that I've been there. The, when I first started the show, there was obviously some parents and kids on the floor. Mm -hmm. And now when I look out there, I'd say like 20% of our audience is 12 and under. It's Wait. a massive difference. And it's not just kids. It's like 12 year olds with like double fisting Zion cases with $40,000 of cards in each case. And, they yeah, and, they're, wheeling and they're wheeling and dealing more than I ever will there. I, I follow them around and try to learn some tips because they're they, really good at it. They are like, I have a, I have a 10 year old who lives two doors down from me who like always tries to sell me cards. I'm like, <laughs> you are relentless. I love it. Um, he's really good, but you're right. And I should, I should, preface the kids part by saying i'm 45 now so anyone 25 and under is a kid <laughs> yeah. to me uh but yeah like there is a huge a huge growth in in uh in that space right a huge amount of interest from them and they're not just doing it to flip like obviously they know and they're more savvy mm -hmm. than i could have ever been at their age right yep. they know how to use the internet they have much more access to information when i was a kid doing this you look through the becket you yeah. search through you're waiting for the new month to come out so you can see if your card went up or down like now it's seconds and they're and they look at the comps on on ebay and they know how to do it and they're like oh here's the three last three comps and they'll show you they have no problem there there's no pulling the wool over on these kids and what are you guys doing to help cater to kids more this year because i know you mentioned the other day that you're kind of upping your game as far as that goes we are. And one of the things that we want to do is encourage that uh, interactions with with kids amongst each other, the trading. So what we're doing is we're adding a kids trade section right by the stage to allow kids to have their own safe space to trade amongst each other. We'll have a couple people there making sure everything's going well and there's no hurt feelings in there and no one's taking advantage of them. But again, creating space to kids to be part of this this hobby. Right, they are going to be the drivers. They are the future of the hobby, and if they have great experiences, much better ones than I had when I was twelve years old, they're going to be lifelong members of the hobby. It soured me, right? Like coming out of when I was a kid collecting and the way the sports cards were there. Again, there was no, there was no real guidebook other than the get the back it. There was no huge mark. There wasn't an eBay. There wasn't an eBay where millions of cards are being sold every day. So it just feels more above board. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I love the fact that you're creating spaces for them to well, have their own space, but then to nurture their involvement in the hobby, which I think is a real good thing. So in general, like, what's the expo stance on trading? Do you guys encourage anyone that wants to make trades to be able to do so or are there specific areas or how, how does that work at the show uh well listen so trades are definitely encouraged it is trading cards first and foremost right like that we forget that when money gets involved but that was the whole <laughs> idea behind this hobby was trading cards and there's tons of ways like there's all, always even even jeff wilson I, I found when he comes in, he's trading cards, not necessarily yeah. straight up, but trade with cash and everything like that. So there's a couple ways people can do it. There's obviously, we've got a couple trade nights. So specifically, we've got Mint Inc. on Saturday night. This, this is our official trade night. We have a fan appreciation night on the Friday. Uh, both places are, are really great places to start the trade, especially the Mint Inc., which is really geared towards that. And the second part is, and, and you see it, is People walking around with backpacks on, yeah. they're either looking to sell or looking to trade, right? And it's just going up to vendors, knowing your value, what the value of the card is, understanding that they have to not pay that exact dollar amount because they've got to get some margin and stuff like that, and going in with that understanding and then going and approaching dealers because they're looking for new product too. 
right? Yep. And if they can get something good from you and you can get something good from them, that's that's amazing. For us, it's all helping build the community. So we definitely encourage it and we'd love to see it. I'm really happy that you say that. And Troy, I think you've probably heard of this as much as I have. There's a lot of shows here in the US that have been really clamping down. Yeah, it's weird. On, on, on trading where they they if you don't have a table, you're not so if two people do a deal and it's not connected to a paid for table that they've been thrown out of shows. I've seen that. I, I actually did see something like that, and that is not what we're about. Like I understand the need and and I get it from the show's perspective. They're they're saying, well, you know, we didn't, you know, you don't have a table here, and then you're hurting the vendors, but it all helps. The truth yeah. is we have a waiting list of 40 vendors. So even <laughs> if you wanted to get into the show, you're likely having a tough uh -oh, time Josh, getting a table. Josh, put our name in. You better put our name in at some yeah. point. <laughs> it's tough. So we understand it. And, and look, the owner of the show is about growing the hobby. And and yeah. the way that you don't do that is by throwing paying customers out. No. Right? This is a trading card hobby. I, I repeat that. And I hope... I hope hope I don't get in trouble after this airs, <laughs> but that's, that's our stance, right? Like, look, I mean, don't interrupt the flow of the show. Don't set yep. up a trade in the middle of the hallway, but you know, there's no reason that we would remove someone for, for engaging in their hobby. Yeah. I mean, be respectful and yes. be a good citizen while you're at the show and do things in their appropriate places. But uh, like you said, glad to, to hear you say that so we've talked about obviously there's gonna be lots of tables with cards we're gonna have a grading pavilion you're gonna have a kid trade area what are some of the other uh, events or things that you have planned for the show this year so i wanted to touch on our guest list yeah, so pretty impressive this, I, and i said it last time we did this show preview it was the biggest list this is the biggest list we've ever had um, you know, alone, we have three current Maple Leafs, Max Domi, Matthew Kine, Joseph Wall, all current Leaf players, on top of which we have Reggie Jackson, Mike Tyson, Rick Flair, Peter Forsberg, uh, Larry Robinson. We have amazing, amazing guests who are coming in. A lot of them are going to be doing Q&As. A lot of the times this is one or like... Peter Forsberg, you're rarely going to get a chance to have a signing with him. It's not mm -hmm. like he's doing a ton of these, uh, especially with some of the current players. You know, there there's some really and and Matthew Kynes is like uh, he's. Am I saying his name right? Nice, yeah. nice, 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 nice. I, I and I looked at it. And I'm like, God, oh, butcher. This, this might be the first time in history where me and Josh actually got yeah. the name right. Yeah, and... nice. So, so <laughs> that's what kind so of we're known nice for. Is, He's getting a really, like, he's obviously a rookie. He's getting a big yeah. push in Toronto. There's a lot of buzz around him. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's going to be in there is a big deal. Uh, you know, it's very rare that we used to get current players, but it just shows you the pull of the event. Carey Price is going to be doing uh, a signing. Uh, that's a really big deal and something that doesn't happen very often. So these are things that we're seeing added to the show. Um, and it's funny, like that area has grown to a point where we have to plan just around some of these guests because there's so many people lining yeah. up for them. Well, uh, I remember we, last year when I think it was last fall when you guys had Matt Sundin, who, of course, in Toronto <laughs> is going to be very, very, <laughs> the line was like that was a long line, very, very long. <laughs> but we moved them through. They were happy at the end of the day. And that's the key. There's always going to be some long lines, especially yeah. with a guy like Matt Sundin or Mike Tyson or, or uh, Carey Price. These are going to create big lineups. The key for us is that we make sure that everyone's having a good experience. Um, they know where they're going. We, you know, we want them to line up because we know it's going to move fast and we don't want them to miss their opportunity. Uh, it's actually one of the things. Not to knock on the national, but I was expecting more from the autograph area there. Well, and I've only been in the national once. So it was this past summer. And one of the things that I appreciate from you guys is their autos were a lot more expensive on average. Like even the, I think Yager, there's a few hockey players that signed, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you'd know, but it wasn't like two, $300 a, US and auto that was kind of the average there. 
It was. It was expensive. It, it was expensive, but they had some. Um, I mean, they had. Sure. Some they had the. Who's I, I who. won't. I won't deny it. I was like, oh, can I? <laughs> but it's funny. Like, what's different in the U.S. versus Canada is you often either they don't sign rookie cards because they have a contract or something, mm-hmm. or it's just the regular flat. But in the U.S., I've found that if you want to get a rookie card signed, there's a specific fee for that. So, like, yeah. I, I had got a Dan Marino that I was like, mm, I'm going to get this signed. And then I see it's $1,000. <laughs> yeah. I was like, maybe I'm not going to get it signed. <laughs> well, so, Troy's going to play catch with Reggie Jackson, I think. I love that. <laughs> I Like, how cool is that? Some of those things are really cool. There's some really cool stuff with Carey Price, too. Like, yeah. those experiences are things that stick with people forever well, some and are like, sold out like it's crazy like i i was looking i'm just i'm looking at it as we talk but like some of the carrie price vip stuff sold out a couple of mike tyson's are sold out so yes yeah. definitely got a market there's people that are chomping at the bit it is and, and those are people who want experiences right mm-hmm. they want that additional memory on top of just the auto and the, the lean in picture and and playing with reggie jackson like uh, you know, one of my, my staff is like, oh, I want to sign up for that. I'm like, you can't because you'll be running that event. So <laughs> don't worry about it. You can jump uh, in while he's trying to play catch with someone else. <laughs> yeah, it's really neat. Like, uh, honestly, it's really cool. Um, super excited about that. Super excited about those moments, right? Like capturing them, seeing them happen and watching people melt as they meet their their idols is is a really special thing. And, and creating those memories for people is really nice. We should probably mention that tickets are sold in advance on your on your website. What's the URL of the website again, Troy? Sportcardexpo.com or sportcard expo toronto.com. Well, you can just go to sportcardexpo. You know, yeah, just, just, right just to Google it and you'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, the... it's embarrassing for me. Steve's going to see this and he's going to be like, oh, you put it. <laughs> But um, um, yeah, it's super exciting. We're really excited about that area. And again, we've got great content for the stage. You guys will be up there talking about hockey. Uh, really stoked about that. And a couple other things about the content creators. As per usual, great additions. Jeremy Lee will be there. Jay for Mojo Sport. Coach Co. Basically, a lot of your crew. It's going to yeah. be out at this show. It'll just be connections for you. I swear to God, every time I see something from Coach Co, it's like he's always referencing something <laughs> that you guys have put up in terms of pricing. Oh, and here's Hockey Gong Show. Look at this that they put up. So you guys have really made yourselves uh, the go-tos for hockey information in the hobby. So kudos to you. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, we should probably talk. I kind of want to talk about like the schedule of the show too, because it there's a preview on Thursday night, which is the 9th of November. Yeah. And really in earnest, the show begins is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Can you kind of walk through sort of like, you know, the daily schedule and that sort of thing? Yeah. So the, the first day, as you said, is a Thursday. 4 p.m. Uh, we're only open for four hours, but we have content running on the stage. In fact, uh and then we also have <laughs> which is great that we're talking about this but our our hockey uh hobby content creators panel with uh you guys will be on it with jeremy lee jay and brandon uh coach co talking yeah. about content creation and that will be on the on the sorry sorry i messed up you'll be on the thursday you'll be talking about hockey talk Obviously, we've got a lot with with very similar, except drop J off of that. And the reason we're talking about that is we're really the release of series one is happening around the show. But yeah. obviously, there's a, a, a new prospect who many people may not have heard of. His <laughs> name's Connor Bedard, uh, and the hype around it, right? Like he's, it, he's a hockey player. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's a little known guy. People haven't been watching him since he was 14 and like literally counting down the days till this kid got into the league. Like <laughs> as he broke records, people just started salivating and waiting for him to enter the league. Yeah. And, and now the hype is real. He's yeah. playing. They can see the product. He's getting better by the week. Um, so it's going to be exciting to talk about that. And And look, me and Josh had an hour conversation about this that we don't obviously don't need to rehash here, but going through it. And so I, I appreciate 
the knowledge that you guys bring. And that's why the stage has become so important because again, the more knowledgeable the, the hobbyist is the, the better off he is making his choices, making his investments, uh, or making purchases for his PC, you know, what yep. you? Mm -hmm. uh, I, per, so this is a, uh, future watch to Steven Stamkos. Oh, I love, it. love it. Nice. That's the, the brand that I like. Uh, I like SP Authentic Future Watch. That's that's what I specifically like. Came out and today. I'm going to hand over a couple that I'm going to get graded. I just got a Phil Kessel. There you go. Did it come with a hot Boy. dog? Did what? <laughs> did it come with a hot dog? I wish it did. I wish it did. <laughs> you could. If he hung out with me, he would know that we have very similar eating habits. <laughs> Mikey, you could have planned that better because. I guess this, I don't know when this interview gets inserted and, in. oh no, it'll be next Monday. So on, we're also going to be recording our Thursday show tonight after this. And I'm previewing a Phil Kessel card, his young guns from the, for the PWCC auction. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. So yeah. So I love these cards. Like I think yeah. they are the nicest. So Jonathan Tays. Nice. Nice. These all came in, uh, as you can see, I bought them from eBay. And yep. they are oh, the, in, in the guarantee. Authenticated. That's how you know they were expensive. <laughs> <laughs> they got go. authenticated. And then finally, Patrick Kane. Um, Beauty. So all of these are, are what I, I collect. I'm trying to, to grade them. I'm actually probably going to crack clean the Stamkos. Got a little lower grade than I was hoping for. Clean it, crack it, send it back in. Gotcha. Of the four days, I guess, including the Thursday preview, what, what's typically the busiest day of the show? Saturday. Saturday? By okay. Far. And it's by, you know, and look, Friday and Sunday have become massive. Uh, honestly, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I started talking about the schedule and I just skipped over it after talking about Thursday. But we'll <laughs> jump back into it. But on, um, on Friday, you'd think school was off. But yeah. the amount of dads with their kids. And it's just them getting into the show because they know they can get in earlier um, and not have the crowds. And look, Saturday is obviously the busiest day because it's the day that no one really has work or school or anything. Yep. And from start to finish that day, it is packed. Uh, you know, typically we have a thousand people or so waiting in line just to get in to start the day. So it's it's definitely a very busy day. Um, the show has grown to now, you know, not including 12 and under because we don't track or charge for them. Uh, the show is now 20,000 plus paid attendance and growing. Uh, we expect that to wow. be beyond this year. So it really is a huge event. And then in terms of like some of the other things that we're doing with kids is we've got giveaways for the kids. So the Megan boys, uh, who are uh, a bar mitzvah DJ company in Toronto and <laughs> friends of mine, they are the hype machine. Uh, Giard and Paige, they're going to be coming in and doing giveaways for the state from the states for the kids, like we've done over the past few shows. Uh, we give them cards and make them do breaks and stuff like that, and really have some fun with them. Uh, yeah. It's been a really great experience. Uh, it's fun to see the kids come up and really open the packs and get really into it. It's really nice. Uh, so excited to do some more of that. And then, uh, we've got some great, you know, Q and A's on the Friday. We have Bernie Perrant coming in. Uh, and then we have the triple crown line coming in. Uh, on the Saturday morning, the chase podcast will be on with, uh, they'll be doing a live, uh, airing of the, the podcast from the show with a special guest. Doug Gilmore's doing a talk. Peter Forsberg's doing a talk. John Gibbons is doing a talk. Ray Bork, uh, Dave Winfield, Larry Robinson, Tim Raines. So really great stuff in terms of the talks. Um, and, then, uh, and then we got the panels, uh, which have been uh, honestly like a huge plus for the show. The panels have been really nice to add because again, we're trying to educate everyone. Uh, that's why I don't give you guys any guidelines on what to talk about. I always hope that you're nice to our sponsors, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we want you to give the proper information out to the audience. Uh, that's what the advantage is. And, and then your crowd gets to meet you. 
You know, yeah. I've seen it a couple times on the show floor, especially more more live show than the show the first time around. People are stopping mm-hmm. you and being like, "Hey, <laughs> well, Troy's a celebrity. We <laughs> yeah. we've already we've already covered that." <laughs> Uh, and I think one thing to point, that's important to point out about all the content and panels that even for people that are not at the show, you're streaming those out correctly. Or correct? We are. So every every piece of content on the panels is both recorded to stream later on our YouTube channel, but also through the app. So if you download the app and, and the app is hugely important and why we've spent so much money developing it and working on it. It is a great source of information for your schedules for push notifications, for for signing timings, uh, special giveaways that we're doing. So having the app, downloading the app is a great way to be involved. And again, we've already started pushing stuff out there. So there's always a prize for for downloading the app, for engaging in it. Um, We're also doing more to push the dealers to be on there more. And we're always looking to increase, like change the app, make it better. So Anyone who's out here listening, if you have any suggestions on the app or something that you feel is missing, <laughs> let us know. Again, this is something native that we're doing that continues to live on and we're constantly working on it. You can reach out to me at Mikey at MKEM.ca. Uh, happy to hear it from you guys. Happy to hear how we can make that app uh, more engaging for you. Great. So you mentioned that you're above, up to about 20,000 paid attendees, not including kids 12 and under. I'm curious, though, and you've been involved since 2018, have you seen a shift in the percentage of Americans that are coming up to go to the show? Is it increasing? Is it the same? Kind of where are we at? It's hard to tell for attendees, right? Because it's not like we check them at the door. And a lot of the crowd is still walk up, right? They still Mm -hmm. buy on site. So I I can't tell you for sure, but at least 10 to 15% of our audience is, is U.S. Okay. Is U.S. based, and, and and that's people from driving from Michigan, from Buffalo, from New York, in in and around those areas, and some people coming from California. And the same holds true for our exhibitors. About ten to fifteen percent of our exhibitors are from the U.S. Gotcha. So I'm kind of curious about like pro tips. So maybe whether it's a Canadian that hasn't been before, or maybe been once or twice or an American that's going for the first time or coming, I don't know, from Europe or somewhere like that. But what are like a few tips that you would give people to really have the best experience at the expo? Okay. So, so a couple, couple tips, wear comfortable shoes. You're <laughs> it's 200,000 square feet. You gotta be walking like on a day of the show, 25,000 steps. So don't wear dress yeah. shoes, right? Like wear comfortable pants. Come. Also, don't lug around a suitcase. Like unless you absolutely need to and you're selling yeah. that stuff, try to limit what you're carrying around because it will be a problem for you after hour one or two, right? Yeah. Second thing is bring a bottle of water, right? It is hot in there. It is dry. You're going to need it. And then cash is king. Right. Like you can always do stuff through PayPal or anything like that. But if you want to deal on something, cash is king. Doesn't matter if it's Canadian or American. Vendors will take either or your American cash is just as good as Canadian here. I promise you, Um, especially because the, you know, the market really is driven by U.S. dollars. Right. So a lot of the comps, things like that, you can find them very easily. Uh, and then the, the last part is come come with a great attitude, right? Like if you come in positive, you will get positive out of it, right? Like you, if you go and you're engaging and you're happy with the vendors, I'm not saying every single person is going to be the nicest in the world, no. but I will tell you 80% of them are excited to see and talk to you, right? Don't mm-hmm. be afraid to ask questions either. We all sometimes get shy and intimidated. Ask questions. And and look at pricing and don't be afraid to shop around. Yeah. So you don't even think it's necessary for if we're coming from the U.S. to do like some sort of currency conversion? Zero. Zero reason you need to do that. Gotcha. I got a pro then, tip, Josh. Yeah. What's your pro tip? My pro tip is if you are going on Saturday, you better make sure just make sure you get there in time because I think it's the same deal. I just looked it up as last year. The expo's going on. There's also the Fall Cottage Life Show, and there's also the Seasons Christmas Show at the yeah. same place. Yep. And we found Arcane. out we were the last. I swear we were the last car <laughs> in on that Saturday. 
Um, what so I will say for this, there is an overflow lot. And you guys did just get in, but it is. Saturday <laughs> is going to be crazy. I yeah. actually know the owners. I've got to I gotta make a call to them. But I know <laughs> the owners of the Cottage Life show. Uh, they're going to be busy. It's a, it's a mix of seasons yeah. and Cottage, the, the, the same event. Uh, but it does. It fills up. Between us and them, the parking lot's going to be full. Get there early. Yep. Uh, and, and look, if it's full, don't panic. The parking lot attendants will guide you to the overflow yep. lot at the GO station. I promise. And then when that fails, they start bringing them back in. But we we do get to a point where it is pretty pretty tough. I, leave, I love that you've got Slabsharks.com up here. I see you've been talking <laughs> to that crew. <laughs> Yeah, both of them and PWCC sponsor our show. So they call me out for seeing my name on their orders too much, which is embarrassing. Because <laughs> uh, it's great, honestly. Like as a Canadian, uh, not having to pay duties. Sorry, I moved myself off screen. Not having to pay <laughs> duties and not having to worry about across the border, especially on some of the expensive yeah. stuff. Look, like uh, something that's like two grand or something like that coming across the border. I'm paying duties on it, and it's an extra two, three hundred bucks. Uh, if I don't have to cross it, that's all the better. Yeah. Also, no, I'd like to state one more thing. When I started in 2018, my hairline was a lot better. So the stress <laughs> of this show and Steve has caused this. That, that's why I wear a hat. So you <laughs> that's right. Yeah, me too. So <laughs> I went, I must have been like 32 or 33, like when you're much more sensitive about it than in your mid 40s. And, you know, like in hair salons, they have those like real cruel mirrors that always make <laughs> you look like. Where they do times. the mind. Yeah, yeah, balder than you actually are. And I was yeah. looking at my hairline and I, and I and I looked at the woman who's kind of my hair and I said, How many years do you think I have left? And she said, Oh, probably two or three. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like dejected. Now I, I I it's not real thick, but I'm 46 now and I still have hair. So I've uh definitely survived that estimate. But yeah, that was a very uh depressing haircut. I got oh, I, I thought I was gonna end, like I look at my dad. I thought I'd end up with the Picard, you know. Oh, yeah. the, the, <laughs> but oh, yeah. luckily, it's still there. It's a lot thinner. Although daughters and kids have a way of really crushing you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day, I was walking out of the the house, and my daughter looked at me from the top of the stairs and said, "Dad, I can see your bald spot." I'm like, ah, <laughs> I think I'm gonna get a hat right now. <laughs> so, so how, how many people? work on your team how many people does it take to put on a show like this that's two hundred thousand square feet over four days so we have seven full-time staff working on this through the year and then we bring in another 40 staff to help wow. run this event it is a huge undertaking and i don't and like look if we do our jobs right no one knows right yeah it's only when <laughs> Only when something goes wrong, does anyone notice the man behind the curtain? And that's mm -hmm. us, right? Like, we need to make sure the auto area is running well. We need to make sure, you know, the booths, the stages, the the lineups, everything's moving moving smoothly. That way, no one has anyone com any, any major complaints. Um, and then you never really see us. How many days do you sleep after the show's over? <laughs> zero i have a show on the monday oh oh wow yeah it's a busy season for us so uh, but it's not nearly as fun what my love is is these shows not that i don't love my other clients but the favorite show i have is is this event um the owner's a very special person uh he is he cares he really tries to add to the show which is why it's grown it isn't by accident Right. Yeah. He is invested in the event. He invests in, in, in the people he brings in. He invests in in the elements to make it more fun for the audience. Uh, he's really done a lot to, to build this into the event that it is today. And you've expanded in the last year, too. So traditionally, it's been the Fall Expo and then the Spring Expo, <coughs> both in Mississauga, Toronto. But then you expanded to Edmonton last year yep. as well, right? We we went at it's a, it's two second year we've done Edmonton. Okay, second year. So and Edmonton was you know we tried it uh, the year previous in April and then uh, the next year it like that that first year was amazing and the next year it grew by another twenty percent. So 
We're going to be back, obviously. Edmonton's been really good to us. Uh, we have some great exhibitors there. They come in from Calgary. They come in. And it was funny. We were at the Montreal show and had dinner with an exhibitor who was convinced. I mean, we it was Steve. Uh, I was there listening to the conversation. <laughs> but they, they said, you got to try this. And, and being Steve, who he is, took the risk. Uh, and it has paid dividends. We also help out with a show in the U.S. Um, a Strongville's Strongville's Collector Convention, and that show is super cool. If you're looking for vintage, gotcha. uh, it, I think it's actually the longest running hobby show. Period. Mm. Ah, very cool. So, is there any more like future plans to expand within Canada or? You know, oh, for, the US? for sure, which I'm not privy to or, or yeah. privy to talk <laughs> about. <laughs> but there's definitely plans. Um, you know, the owner of the event, again, he is really aggressive, always trying to be creative, always thinking about what the next thing is. It's It's been incredible to be tied to him. Well, anything else that people need to know about the show coming up now in just a few days? uh yes the the other thing is is that um if you're you know there's going to be a lot of authentication as well at the show so jsa is there beckett's there psa is there with dna for the first time so again if you're looking for that authentication more options for you and then vaulting uh psa pwcc and comc are all there in big ways accepting submissions and obviously that has become a bigger part of the hobby Yep. Right. Uh, it has become a, a more integral part, everything like that. And then finally, you know, uh, it's just it's going to be better than I, I said this already a couple of times, but it really is going to be the best show we've ever <laughs> had. Um, and, and, uh, and I encourage everyone to check out the website, buy your autograph. If you have a guy you want to get an autograph ticket for, save yourself a headache, save yourself some time, buy it in advance. Perfect. Any additional questions for Mikey, Troy? No, I. you hit everything I had on my checklist. I'm just super excited to go now that I feel like I'm a little bit more confident in how I'm going to approach the show. <laughs> and I will say the whole like walking around, I mean, I had comfy shoes on, but I remember that first night getting back to like the Airbnb where we were and my legs, I was just like, oh boy. <laughs> you together. feel it, right? And it's going to yeah. be worse this year. You really yeah. do. And day two, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm sore. And now I'm going to make everything worse. So yeah. it, Hobbling it is... in. I had my backpack. I didn't have a lot in it. I use it just to store everything I buy there. But yeah, it's. Uh, I'll just repeat. It's a fantastic experience. If you're a hockey card collector, it is, it's hockey mecca for us, for everyone that, that loves hockey cards. So I can't wait. And congratulations again, you guys, uh, on growing this show to where it is today. Starting from a, a passion project to uh, becoming celebrities. Well, Troy's a celebrity. Uh, I'm just his manager. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just the hype man. You're just the, the hype, hype man. man. Yeah. That'll, uh, that'll ultimately steal all his money. That's, yeah. That's, I Josh, love that. That's Josh is going to be the one following me around with a camera and the boom that's, mic. That's right. it. <laughs> that, uh, that's another thing. Uh, yeah. I, you know, we didn't talk about this, but, you know, we've got content creators who are coming in, but yeah. on top of those, there's going to be tons more, yeah. right? Like the, uh, the ability to do that and, and what the, you know, the Gen Z generation can do with a, an iPhone. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and they're, they're just far ahead of us, right? Like, yeah. so there's really great content creators. I don't even notice it until I do a search afterwards on some of the other ones who, <laughs> who are in there. Uh, but we're really excited. We've even had a couple kids who are like 12 years old who really started their own channels and wanted to get out there. So, I'm excited to see that and um, excited to see you guys in person again. Yeah. Can't wait. Uh, thank you again for carving out some time. And uh, it's uh, one of the highlights of the year for us. So looking forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. And for more information at sportcardexpo.com is where you go. Not only Sport to get card Expo, Josh, Josh, Sport Card Expo Toronto .com. Okay, but yeah. either one, either one will take you there. Either, <laughs> either one, one will either take one you there. I promise. Uh, so we're I, both then, right, Troy. 
Finally, I'll just do one plug for another appearance I'm doing. I'm going to be on Jeremy Lee's Sports Card Live on this Saturday night uh, talking about the show. So if you want to tune in, please do. Um, well, that's a great plug, but this will air after that. So we'll just say... <laughs> Ignore we that. Con- just we cut that out. That. <laughs> <laughs> we, we hope you caught Mikey's appearance. But you- Jeremy's show is not just live. You can go back. So go back and watch Mikey's yeah, appearance go. on That's Jeremy it. Lee's Sports Card Live, which happened this past. It's the weird space kind time continuum, yeah. Mikey. You just That's it exactly. You have to get used to it. All right, man. Well, we'll see you again soon. And again, thanks for your time. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you to Mikey again for coming on the show. I don't know, Troy, did he get you excited about this week? Oh, yeah. He, I mean, he, there wasn't much he could do to get me more excited. But then when he kind of started talking about the, how big the show, like the extra yeah. space they've added and vendors and stuff. Yeah, I got a little more excited. The auto lineup or signer, signer lineup is amazing. Yeah. It seems like that they just keep getting bigger and bigger every year. And there's a couple things that I want to add maybe to the, the conversation we had with Mikey it, as a way of a preview. And, and that's really, you know, I look at going to the expo. One of the, or one of the key things that I'm interested in is kind of as one, and it's only one, but one measure of hobby health. And I feel like Troy, the past six months in the hobby, we've seen a real mixed bag of health indicators. I mean, prices and values are definitively now. We know yeah. that for sure. Yep. There's no way you can deny that. Even though on certain things we see record sales, we see big numbers, but across the board, most of the hockey market is down. But then if you contrast that to just a few months ago at the National, it was chaos. <laughs> there were so many people there that are all engaged in the hobby. It was honestly incredible. It made you think that, wow, this hobby is alive and vibrant and growing. Companies were going bigger than, with their activations and their booths than they yeah. ever had. And then you hear from Mikey Expo or Mikey, Mikey Expo. Mikey <laughs> Expo. <laughs> Mikey Expo. <laughs> That's his new name, Mikey Expo. You hear from Mikey Singer that the Expo is now 200,000 square feet. And they're expecting the largest attendance ever. Uh, it, again, it's hard to think that the hobby is like completely in the dump, right? Even though prices are down. And, and so th- to me, that's my main interest. It, or One of my main interests there is observing the people at the show as a kind of a gauge of indicator as to where we're at. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of makes me wonder too, because I've heard this theory being speculated that even though prices are down, that maybe volume isn't as down as much, meaning that people are still buying a lot of cards. They're just not buying them for as much money mm-hmm. each. So yeah, it'll be, you know, my hope is of course that's packed and tons of people are buying and selling and trading and uh, everybody's happy, the dealers and, um, uh, the you know people buying cards as well so uh, do you look at like the, kind of try to get some sort of like feel about the hobby health when you're at a big show like that oh yeah for sure and i mean my nerve my uh anxiousness is already at heightened peak with the large attendance but hopefully the new extra space kind of evens it out but it will be it'll be fun to fun to go to Let's see what's going on Another thing we wanted to do is I thought it'd be fun to give our top 10 reasons to go to the expo if you've never been. And and because I think both of you and I, Troy, are pretty passionate about not ever having been. And if you love hockey cards and you yeah. love the hobby, that there's really, I don't think anything that really compares to it. Nope. So akin to like David Letterman style, we're not going to have like somebody's famous or somebody's famous, their mom <laughs> come out and read the list. But here's my top 10 reasons. Why you should go to the expo if you've never been. You ready, Troy? I'm ready. Reason number 10. Get Troy's autograph. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's only $3 Canadian. And only $10 Canadian if you want to like, catch with <laughs> Troy with the hockey puck for 23 minutes. No, I should have had got a shoot. You can shoot on me. I'll, I'll put on my goalie gear. And you can take 10 clap bombs at my head. My, my, my favorite part of the interview with Mikey was when I threw in the barb about playing catch with Reggie oh, Jackson. Yeah. And, and nothing, I mean, not that Mikey would know, because I'm sure he doesn't listen to our show, but he didn't totally get that I was 
kind of kidding there. And then we had to play it off like, oh yeah, 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 we can't wait to play. Well, I bet, I bet there's more people that I bet there's more people that do 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 that than we would ever imagine. Oh, I'm sure. In all seriousness, though, for us, come meet us, message us, let's connect. It's the best part of the expo for us, and just getting to meet anyone that's ever, I guess, supported or liked or listened to our show or liked us on social media. Um, Hey, that's a that's a. I put it as the last reason to go, but it is a reason. Okay, we're going to talk about these in a minute, but number nine, getting the redemption packs from Upper Deck. It's kind of cool, unique. It's an experience that you only get at the show. And so I think that, uh, you know, I always look forward to that and can't wait to open those packs. My number eight reason to go to the Toronto Sport Card Expo is trade nights. You can actually go to a show with trade nights where people actually collect <laughs> hockey cards they got hockey that's probably cards. more of like an american benefit yeah sure because i assume trade nights in canada are better but normally it's everyone with like basketball and football cards that trade nights here yep. so my number seven reason to go to the expo try you can drop off your cards for consignment at our partner slap sharks right they're they're there i go make it super easy just hand them the card they take care of everything and those bedard cards 98 percent payout rates can't go wrong there those Bedard redemption cards, or not redemption cards, the Bedard, whatever, the super right. short print, the short print that's not short printed. Yeah. It's cr- crazy what those are going for. I think SP is like some number of print. That's what it's yeah, it My number six reason, it, it, and I actually am really kind of glad I thought about this because it, you know, you think that it's just all hockey cards and there's a million of them, believe me there. Yeah. But it's not just hockey cards. There's like tons of memorabilia, like furniture maker, painters that do these amazing paintings or drawings. Yeah. Basically anything you would ever want for a hockey man cave, you're yeah. going to find at Sport Card Expo. So I, as much as I like looking at the cards and kind of in that like main hallway in between halls, yeah. I feel like a lot of that stuff is in. But I really like looking at that stuff to you. Oh yeah, I, I love that stuff. I know they had the the chair or the furniture maker there. The one I don't know if they were there in the spring, but they were there. Yeah, like like benches, fall. or if you wanted a yeah chess set of like your well, favorite NHL team. Yeah, they had those like uh, figures, right? And he had them on like a ring. Yeah, those were pretty cool. That those one, cool. Guy, yeah. Okay, we're getting to our top five now. It's getting serious. Top number five reason to go to the Sport Card Expo. Uh, it's. And this is, again, another one that's for us Americans. So sorry, Canadians. But <laughs> the strength of the U.S. dollar right now to the Canadian dollar is a yep. big advantage going to yep. show. Now, and this is only, might only be a temporary thing. A year or two from now, it could be a totally different story. But your dollar is going to go a lot farther yep. than what has a show here. Number four reason to go to the Expo, I put is Jeremy Lee's Hockey Hobby Get Together for, like, what, dinner drinks at Jack Astor's, which is yep. on Thursday night. Very close to the International Center where the expo is at. I think it starts at 8 p.m. It's really a fantastic opportunity to meet, chat with, network with other people in the hockey hobby. And it's awesome that Jeremy does it. Yeah. And I consider it kind of like a must do if you're at the show. So that's my number four. Number three might be a little bit similar, but just in general, getting to meet up and hang out with hobby friends. Yeah. A lot of our people in this hobby tend to be social media acquaintances and friendships that we develop. And so it just provides a natural meeting point to get together and spend a little face time with these people. And so I think that's a big advantage. The second reason, number two reason, is the amount of vintage hockey cards is incredible. From like pre-war to early parkies to 30s or OPT. If you've ever had an interest of, you know, you'd be why I was at Jeremy Lee's table and some guy pulled out to show him a, C55 1911 Vesna, right? Oh, jeez. You just, it's like, when else do you start <laughs> like this? And so I think, and even if you're more of an ultra modern collector, just to yeah. soak in vintage a little bit and to be able to appreciate it, I think is pretty awesome. And then the number one reason we say it all the time it's hockey card heaven. There's no other card show for the hockey hobby that compares, period. Like you just said, 200,000 square feet of predominantly hockey yeah. cards. You just A new hall. It. They had to open up another hall. hall. Yeah. Any other? So how, how's my top 10? Did I miss Like anything? your top 10. Um, you missed Troy having his Monty Python cart of wax that I'm going to wheel around instead of yep. dead bodies. To bring out your dead. I'm going to be like, <laughs> bring out your wax. And I'm bring out your wax. <laughs> I'm going to pick it up and roll it around. 
yeah, there's it's there's so much cool stuff. And if you can go there for the three days, just take your time at every table. And I think your additional tips, I'll, I'll have another thing in there. But yeah, it you're you're dead on with the list. It's awesome. I can't wait. Three or I'll be there probably well, I'll probably be there Friday, is what I'm looking at. You're gonna be there a day or before me. Some additional tips for success at the expo. First, I just want to reiterate a couple of things Mikey said because I think they're really important. Uh, comfortable shoes are a much. You're gonna walk. Yeah. If you're gonna get your ten thousand steps in that day, believe me. And it's, <laughs> Time like you said, with, with the new hall, there's just a yep. lot of walking. And then to be mindful of what you're carrying. Who's the the? It's Seth, right? That's Seth. Exactly. Yeah. I Seth has his, tons of stuff. God bless that guy. He is an awesome human being. Yes. I I, I hope. Seth, that you're going to be there again so we get to connect. But, and he's a huge Senators fan. He brings basically his entire club. He's like a pack mule. Yeah. <laughs> now it kind of works for him because he, yeah. he'll show you, like, these are like the 47 great deals I got today. Yeah. But he must lose like 30 pounds of water weight. Yep. Just, um, hauling everything. But he never looks winded. He always is, yeah. he must be a great shape because he always just like, here's all my stuff. And boom, and he knows where exactly everything is, pulls it all out. It's awesome. Not for me. <laughs> Another great point that Mikey made is cash is king. You're going to yeah. get a much better deal if you have cash. Um, so if you can, I think it's well worth to do that. And then this is kind of related, but, um, and I wouldn't expect Mikey to mention this, but if you're from the U S be very mindful of conversion rates. I think yeah. maybe savvy dealers there will try to play conversion bingo with you. Yep. And cause remember that hundred dollar bill uh, that Benjamin Franklin that you have is worth about 70 yeah. Canadian dollars. And so uh, you got to be very mindful of what kind of conversion rate you can agree on. And, and I think when in doubt, just say what conversion rate are you using? No, no, go the other way. I was like, that didn't sound right. That hundred dollar U S is one thirty seven Canadian. Oh yeah. Yeah. One thirty seven Canadian. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. My bad. It's not a mass show trick. <laughs> We'd have really made some people mad if they <laughs> listened to us. And Mikey also mentioned about bringing, you can bring U.S. dollars, which I, I agree with him 100% you can, but I still also am bringing Canadian funny money because I like to play with their Monopoly money. And yeah, I was going to wonder if you were going to disagree with that. And I, I uh, think he, he's, I mean, he's right. They, they, they don't care. They'll take American or Canadian. They don't care. But I like to have, I like to do it beforehand, get my conversions. So I got the math and I don't have to do it right there. I just have Canadian money that I got. I, th I imagine that his kind of perspective in saying that is more of a convenience that you don't have to, you don't have to go yeah. through the hassle or yeah. the other of, of doing it. But, but I do kind of agree with you. I think if you want to kind of maximize your negotiating opportunity, it's pro mm -hmm. probably, we could be wrong, but I think it's probably better to have Canadian dollars. Remember too, we've talked a lot about in the last recent months in comping. If you're looking at a card, working at a big, on a big trade, or a big purchase and you're using eBay sales history, slow down, find a way yep. to verify that that sale is paid for in Terapeak so that you're not basing a trade or a sale or a purchasing decision. Well, sale probably doesn't usually works to their advantage, but a purchase yeah. based on a comp quote unquote that was never paid for. Next tip I have is the show is big. So if you're looking for something specific, ask around. Yeah. If you're asking, if you're looking for like me, a glow PG, like I'm just going to ask any, hey, have you guys seen one around anywhere else? So, cause it's almost hard to take in every card there and maybe yeah. someone can point you in the right direction. And then last thing I have, Troy, and I'll turn it over to you at that point is we weren't kidding about parking when we brought it up to Mikey in the interview, <laughs> especially Saturday. Get there. Saturday will be nuts. You get there. Early. You might be turning around, going back to your Airbnb or hotel or wherever you're staying and, and Ubering or finding because it was chaos yeah. last fall, especially. So what other kind of tips or tricks do you have to write? No, I think I hit it. I want to talk about the whole cash thing and all that. Um, the parking thing. Being smart, what you bring. Don't don't bring too much where you're going to be so tired by the end of the show that yeah. yeah, your legs hurt. Unless you're Seth. Seth, <laughs> none of this applies to you because you somehow can carry every card in your collection around. It'd be fine. But yeah, it's uh, it's a great time. 
talk to people again if you're looking for specific stuff ask these people have probably seen it somewhere around there um yeah i'm just excited i'm so excited to see the new hall i'm excited to see how they're doing the autographs i'm not an autograph like i'm not a big autograph guy but i want to see how they move the lines through and because remember when we talked about matt sundin at the last fall expo we went to the line was incredibly long <laughs> it was crazy yeah. so i wonder how they i'm going to see how they do it because it i was trying to look at the map and it looks like they might have configured it a little different but we'll see and let me know if anyone sees pekka rene cards there thanks <laughs> and message us if you want to connect yeah. and meet up and we want to meet all of you probably the best way to do it is message us on instagram or other social media and it's not like we're we try to check it as much as we can and we'll definitely try to find a place to meet up because that's yeah. one of the main reasons why we go to the show is to meet everybody if you happen to see us out and about please don't hesitate to come up and introduce yourself um because like i said we just want to you know uh, it's a big treat for us to get to meet all of yeah. you guys so okay kind of the last thing and it sort of fits in a new product release is troy yeah. now that we actually have a week off from a major mm -hmm. hockey release which is probably a good thing i think we're all kind of in recovery mode a little bit and appreciating some of the boxes that we've bought over the last few weeks we do though have one product or i guess call it like a new pack announcement or the promo announcement for the expo and upper deck released both details for their fall expo wrapper redemption offer which does include auto cards and promo packs and it, they kind of break it into two categories as the box wrapper redemption and the case wrapper redemption so we're going to go through the details on those first and then we'll cover some of the checklist and what what are some of the cards you can get out of these packs so let's start on the box wrapper redemption piece and by wrapper redemption we mean that you buy a box at the show from a certified diamond dealer so they'll normally have gold balloons that are in the shape of a diamond floating above their table uh, we've made the mistake of was I was just SCAP laughing ending? when you said that because I was thinking about when we bought boxes and we're like, it's they four dollars cheap. cheaper here, Troy. <laughs> oh, we don't get our expo pack. That's <laughs> well, that was another. I guess that was another tip I had is if you want, if you're like a wax guy like me, walk. I mean, I, I think it's part of the game to me is just walking around and see who has the cheaper prices, the cheapest prices, and it'll be very interesting to see it this year. Maybe some of that product we were talking about earlier those 22 23s or anything before series two of next year or 23 24 what what's going on with that so if you if they a certified diamond dealer has one of the balloons you and you buy one of the qualifying boxes which will go over in a minute what they are mm -hmm. you'll get a voucher to take that box back to the upper deck booth where they will, and why, the reason why I call it a wrap redemption is they take the plastic film yep. off of the box and, and so that you can't basically, I think, submit it multiple times. And then when, once they do that, then they hand you your expo pack. So you, and I guess the one note there is if you're a person that's thinking, well, I'll just buy a box and resell it on the secondary market and get my free expo packs, it doesn't really work because they're removing that plastic wrapper yeah i mean you can still sell it just saying it's unsealed and maybe probably doesn't go it. for much at that yeah point. so here's the boxes that qualify for that it's 2023 24 series one 2020 and then all the rest are 22 23 products so it's synergy allure hockey spx metal universe hockey and aew metal universe some wrestling cards in there troy that you can redeem for your hey, upper deck throw in some marvel cards maybe if you're gonna start throwing non-hockey cards let's let's go all in and throw some marvel stuff in there thanks now there's a limit on six per person per day so you get six fall expo redemption packs are you worried about that limit no <laughs> do you think you're gonna hit it no now for the case wrapper redemption the prizes get a little bit sweeter so in yeah. addition to 10 fall expo redemption packs that you get for one case, you also get a randomly signed autograph card. We'll go over the, what those are, some yeah. of them in the checklist. And they typically, those autograph cards, they'll typically have displayed in a case at the upper deck booth. So you can see, and I don't know how they pick it, or maybe there's like, it's like a drawing or something like that, and they're hmm. numbered or something. It's the same case products that are qualified for the case wrapper redemption. So it's 2023 24 series one. Then 2022 Synergy, Allure, SPX, Metal Universe Hockey, and AEW 
wrestling metal universe. Now, this has a, a six case redemption limit per customer <laughs> per day, too. Yep. So, you know, the and I, I think the redemption packs are fun. And you'll we'll see in the checklist, you don't get anything typically too crazy, but there's some autos that can be randomly inserted and stuff like that. Are you a big fan of the redemption packs? Is that a big motivator for you while at the show? It's not a motivator for me, but it's a nice bonus to have when I do buy something to know that those are available. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the checklist so we can see what kind of cards you can get in these packs. And from the case, uh, the random autos that you get through the case redemption. So in the packs, Troy, there's 82 cards total on the checklist. Okay. 32 of those are Upper Deck Choice branded, and they're basically base veteran cards. There's eight base rookies that have the Victory Black branding on the card, and those rookies are Luke Hughes, Matthew Nyes, Dustin Wolf, Simon Edvinson, Marco Casper, Owen Beck, Devin Levi, and Yaroslav Askarov. So there's no Connor Bedard in these redemption packs. I think <laughs> that's very important to get out. Yes. I'm sure he'll be everywhere in spring. Yep. But don't assume that you're going to have a Bedard chase. Heck, he might well, be at the expo in the spring <laughs> if, if they're not in the playoffs. <laughs> what if they had him as an autograph signing at the expo? I They'd have to shut it down. I, I honestly believe they'd get too many. There'd be a Break fire, the code, expo. fire code violation. No, I think the, I think the actual the season's still going when the spring expo's going. There's also six CHL star rookies from 2022, 23. Yeah. yeah. Nobody worth mentioning on the checklist. Then in the auto, so these are these again, these are all in the packs, these first ones. So any pack pulled auto are is either numbered to 25, 50, or 75. There's 35 cards in total. They're not super huge names. So there are some rookies like Askarov and Faber. Then there's mid-level stars like from the past year or, or last year's rookies like Boldy, et cetera. But no, nobody, you're not going to get like a Wayne Gretzky in one of these expo promo packs. The biggest autos, Troy, are reserved for the people that do the case redemptions. Which makes get sense. that random yeah. card in addition to the packs. Now here you can get autos from players like Yager, McDavid, Gretzky, Patrick Waugh, Leon Dreisaitl, and then the bigger rookies like a Luke Hughes. There's 18 total cards in that checklist. There's also two cards that are dual signed. So there's a Luke Hughes Owen Power dual signed card. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, it's on here, right? Is that this one? Yeah, and so that must home. be like the Michigan Wolverine connection, right? Nice. Essentially, and that's out of three. Then I'm sure like a real popular one, it's a one on one, but Patrick Waugh, Carey Price. That'd be sweet. Like, I'm not even that big of, I'm a Waugh fan. I'm not the biggest Carey Price guy, but that'd be a sweet card. So that's basically your checklist overview for the redemption packs. Okay, got to move on real quick and make a quick uh, PWCC mention. Of course, they're a gong show partner and sponsor, and we're very thankful to them for their support of our show and the hockey hobby in general. The November PWCC Premier Auction is live and runs through, the, through November 16th. There's just two cards in this month's Premier Auction, but they're two very, very nice cards. There's a 1979 OPG Wayne Gretzky PSA 8. Very, very nice card. Yes, we look at a lot of cards in the PWCC weekly. A lot of Gretzky rookies, the Jeremy Lee, and I'm getting a little bit better at my able to assess one of these. I always say it's like a hobby in of itself, and yeah. to me, this looks like a very, very nice copy. This so. is the first thing I always look at: it's the oil drop. The oil see where it's at. Yeah, yeah. Then beyond that, there's a 1951 Parkhurst Gordy Howe rookie PSA six. This one has the PWCC E or exceptional eye appeal rating. So putting in the top 15%, there's 55 copies with the PSA six grade, 90 copies graded higher. This is, and I, I'll say all the time on the, on our weekly YouTube show with Jeremy, to me, the key thing for vintage is eye appeal. Yeah. And this card just no matter what flaw, and you're going to have flaws at a PSA yep. six, yep. but the centering just looks awesome. The picture looks yep. good. The text, so I would definitely agree with PWCC here to put in the top 15% for the PSA 6 copies. And if you don't have the PWCC Premier type bankroll, you're not Troy. Huh. You're like me, and where the weekly auction is a bit more your speed. The current PWCC weekly auction is live, ends this upcoming Sunday night. 180 hockey cards in this week's auction, ranging from... And that's the thing with the PWCC weekly. You get just a, a huge spectrum of... Vintage and modern. So you got 
all the way back to the 1911 C55 set to very ultra modern cool cards. Uh, remember on Thursday show, Troy and I will pick out our favorite, both vintage and modern cards from the auction to highlight. Uh, be sure to head to pwccmarketplace.com, whether it's for the premier auction, their fixed price marketplace, or the weekly auction to check out all the cards and place your offers or bids. And then one more quick note, because of the expo, this upcoming Sunday night, uh, I know you're going to be devastated, Troy, but <laughs> there's no PWCC weekly watch party with Jeremy and myself on his Sports Cards Live YouTube channel because we'll be traveling back from the expo. Mail big time. All right, here we go. Let's get right into it. From Twitter slash X, 816 Cards and Collectibles says, I like this question. I think it's really appropriate. Is now the time to flip my Jack Hughes Young Guns PSA 10, or do I keep waiting for a few more weeks? The way I would answer this 816 is, if your intention is to sell the card, if it's not like a PC card that you want to hold for a long time, I'm a huge fan of taking wins versus trying to get every last ounce of profit out of a card. I'm sure whatever card you have, if you haven't sold it already, was worth more a week ago than it is yeah. today, just because anything can happen like he gets hurt. Yep. And we don't, it's very ambiguous as to when he's coming back at this point. And I know that there's, the, I feel it myself, that there's this temptation. Oh, I don't want to sell the card. Even though I bought the card for 200, if I sell it for 600 and it's worth a thousand six months from now, I'm going to be so mad. I would say if you bought it for 200 and you can sell it for 600, that's a three X multiplier. That's a huge win. Yeah, You should sell it. And you have to, I think, look at it like, not on an individual case, but if you play those averages over time, you'll be much better off because what we tend to forget in thinking about the future is that a card has an equal amount of ch chance to go up or down as it does to go up. And so I don't know, Troy, about you, but I, I, I tend to err to the side of just taking the win. Agree. I always, I'm, actually do that a lot i'd rather take the win than try to squeeze out every little ounce and i don't know when this question came in but if it was before i got injured i just have yep and move on now you might have to do a little more thinking about it but if it's still up a good amount i would i would be moving it if i'm not pc in him next question from discord and louis our good friend louis Hopefully this is just a rookie or occurrence but what effects is this bedard craze going to do to the hobby for your average collector Example is obvious, but imagine the ridiculous pricing for any of the big name 2023-24 hobby boxes. The flagship is at $300. Just a reality that SP Authentic has to be $400 plus, Black Diamond $400 plus, OPG Platinum $400. What are you going to pay for the cup? Like $3,000? <laughs> and priced out, and it's not fun anymore. I think this is a great question, Great Louis. question. And here's what I think about this, is that... And I'm coming kind of coming at this answer from my own perspective too. And what I'm thinking of doing is if 2023, 24 box prices are so ridiculous that it's not fun, I'm just gonna maybe go the other another direction. Cause there's no law that says we have to chase Connor Bedard. And as we've been speculating, if the Bedard chase is nuts, a potential byproduct could be that almost everything else would be cheaper. Yeah. Right. We talk about all the time. There's not an infinite pool of money or an ever expanding pool of money in the hockey hobby that can expand with rising 2023, 20, 24 box values. So personally, if Bedard chase gets crazy, I'm going to start looking for value for deals or values on other cards and other players that I, you know, Leon Dreisaitl that I like or Tim Stutzla or Cole Caulfield. If you're one of his or go back to some of the vintage guys and let everyone else take the bullets chasing number 97 and it's kind of like the FOMO thing. If you can get over that, I think it could actually be a really fun opportunity in the hobby to feel like you're getting deals on stuff that would have been a lot more expensive six months earlier. And that's just my feeling. Do you have thoughts on it? Agree. If, if boxes get ridiculous, I'm out and I'm just going to buy singles of players I like and hopefully get them for a cheaper price. Yeah, I mean, again, everything has to line up perfectly for this Bedard chase in the long run to be worth it. Well, I'll tell you what, he's he's playing pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of playing well. Next question from Discord, Rally SC. Do you sort your hits by year, by team, by set? Do you do a combination of all three? After 40 years of collecting, I still struggle with organizing <laughs> my cards. Rally, fantastic question. Uh, Troy, see my collection. I'm 
pretty much in need of an intervention. <laughs> I cannot figure out a system or organization that works for me. Uh, this is, and it's really part of why I'm trying to call down my collection and get to uh, 40 or so like really great cards, and that's it. But Troy, you do a much better job of organizing organization, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I used to do my sets, and then I started thinking how I really want to do this. And basically, I've come to this. I organize by player, then by base cards, and then everything else. So what I mean is I have boxes for my base cards, and I have little dividers that have every player's name. That goes player base cards are by name, and then I have more boxes, again, by player name. That's everything else. So all the parallels, inserts, autos, etc., go into those boxes. So that's how I do it. It's just worked for me. It's easy for me. If I look at my spreadsheet, I see I have this card. I go to my box if it's a base or whatever it is, and I can find it really easily. That's how. That's kind of where I've landed by player. Next question, Discord, the real H. Diggler. Maybe a question for Billy, but who was it, Dave or Adam, that had to do what they did to get the okay to sell upper deck <laughs> on the website as they do? Or more seriously, not all diamond dealer LCS brick and mortar are allowed to sell online. That's a known. But with them being Dave and Adams setting the market so early based on pre-orders, do you think it's a positive or negative for brick and mortar only shops? I just see more and more LCS is going out of business. And maybe I'm just an old man, but would hate to see the place I grew up spending every Friday night uh, cease to exist in the near future. It's a great question, Diggler. And I think so. Troy and I have learned this over the last year and kind of getting to know Upper Deck and understanding a little bit how their business runs. There's really two kind of authorized retailer programs that they have. So the certified diamond dealers are your local brick and mortar car shops that are certified by Upper Deck. They have to meet certain criteria. Yeah. Then there's what's called internet authorized retailers. And these are the businesses that are authorized to sell the products, hockey products, within their respective countries online online. So if you're just a certified diamond dealer, you're not allowed to do that. And one thing we know too, is there's many more internet authorized retailers in Canada than there are in the U S I think there's some like 14 or 15 in Canada and four or five in the U S. And so Dave and Adams is one of the few U S based internet authorized retailers. I don't know. Like, I don't know. And I guess I wouldn't guess, what the current sway they seem to have over market setting the price, whether that's intentional or not, or if it just kind of organically grew to, to become that. And I'll be honest, I don't, I have nothing against Damon Adams, but I don't, I don't love the fact that they set the market price. And we've asked local car shops here in Minnesota and they set their prices based on yep. David Adams, where David Adams is at. And I just don't know if they, you know, what kind of, qualifies them or in what interest they have or is it in the interest of all the hobby for them to be to be setting their prices i do think though that internet authorized retailers are really important especially for people that live in an area where you don't have an lcs yep so i, I totally agree that they should exist but yeah i'm a little uncomfortable with the current sway that david adams yep. tends to have Agreed. Well, how do you feel well same thing it's like you said we've asked card shops locally what how they use david adams and like you said they all kind of base their pricing off of them yeah. and it's not fun okay next question from discord and philadelphia flyogram with the series two price increase where do you guys see 2024 25 series one being priced at will it stay through the roof or will it go <laughs> back down to earth five dollars because no one will have any money left after after bedard all right troy i'll let you go first on this one no i I, I like I said, I'm guessing lower. I it it needs to come back to earth. I don't want it. They can't keep it up with. I mean, there's no no Bedard talent from the hype perspective. I think in, that we've seen so far in the 24 25 rookie class. Well, you hear about that Macklin Celebrini, but he doesn't yeah. have near the hype Bedard has. Yeah, it doesn't have near the hype, and I'm guessing there won't be anyone that has Bedard level hype. So I'm guessing it's going to come back down to earth, but. But will it get all the way back down? There might be a new little, I don't know what you want to call it, some built-in maybe $20, $30, $40 that they'll try to kind of up it a little for that base yeah. price compared to two years or last year. I agree year. with you. I think that's going to happen, that they will, yeah. they'll bring it 80% the way back. Yeah. Next question, Instagram, Villain Hockey Cards. 
What are your guys' thoughts on getting cards graded by tag to sell? You want to go first, Drew Troy? Yeah, I personally, I really like what tag is doing. I'm really impressed by how they position themselves. And I like the slabs in person. They look great. They're clear. They look really nice. They have the online reporting uh, tool that you can see what they found, like issues with your card. I think still, though, if you're going value, if that all you care about is value, you're still going PSA. But Tag, I think, is doing well and is catching up in some areas. And right now, I'm more, I would get tech cards graded by Tag that I want in my PC. But if I'm going for the absolute value, I'm going PSA for now. But I do like how they look. They look really nice, those Tag slabs. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Good job. Oh, Next yeah. question, Instagram, Duke N19. Will Luke Hughes and Matthew Nye's young gun values increase? Troy, you're very concise answer here, and I like it. So like, well, <laughs> all depends on how they play. Yeah, I can't give you. I can't give you a yes or no. It's just all how. Now, personally, I I think Luke Hughes, if he can recover from this injury, is going to be great. He's done nothing to show me any different. But that's Luke Hughes, not Jack Hughes. Oh, sorry, Luke Hughes. Sorry, I'm thinking Jack. Um, yeah, but again, it's how they play. I don't know. There's no yes or no. It's just what do you think? How they'll play? On paper, though, they seem like more like PC guys. I mean, yeah. again, they may end up being like the biggest superstars ever. Only time will tell, and that's why Troy's very concise answer is probably best. <laughs> but one's a defenseman, and the other one is not like a Austin Matthews type yeah. player. So, yeah, more I would say more PC guys. But next question: Discord Rooster cards and wax. It says, compare the population of Austin Matthews' Young Gun Gem Mints, heavily BGS, to Jack Hughes' Young Gun Gem Mints, heavily PSA. Quite a change in just three years. How might that affect Austin Matthews' BGS slabs moving forward or any other pre-Hughes top-tier player Young Gun, given BGS's fall from grace in the grading marketplace? Uh, I think it's a really good observation. And what I would say about like BGS, because I think this is more about a question about BGS than PSA, is longer term, I'm much more comfortable with the BGS 9.5, that's a true gem or higher, meaning all four subgrades are at least 9.5, maybe a 10 or two, because there's true gem, true gem plus, and true gem plus plus. What I wouldn't hold long term are the min gems. So though that's where you have one subgrade being a nine and then three 9.5s. You have a different opinion on that? <laughs> I've answered enough grading card questions today. <laughs> I think my brain, my brain is done with grading. I've, I've hit my limit, I think. Now, next question from Twitter or X, the Bash and Angler. Oh. You might have asked Troy his favorite question of all time. One of the best questions ever, I think. Yeah. Who is your favorite all-time Minnesota-born player NHL? Or who is your all-time Minnesota-born player NHL starting six? So I'm going to go first because I always get me out of the way so that you can go hog wild. <laughs> so I'm going to say a goalie. I have Jake Ottinger, even ahead of John Casey. But John okay. Casey's metrics weren't as good as. Stuff. Yeah, Casey was. Yeah, he was good. I mean, he was decent. He was, it was a product of his time. Then I, I think there's like two locks that. Yeah. Uh, that one of them on the defense end would be Phil Housley. He's lock yep. number one. Easily. Then here's a guy I can never say. And you can probably say his name. I can never. It's a. Dustin, is it Bufflin? Bifley? Bufflin? Dustin yeah. Bufflin. <laughs> Big buff. Big buff. So those are might be my defensemen. And then I have uh, Neil Broughton on a, as a forward, who I think is the other lock. Yeah. Blake Wheeler and then Zach Parisi. But okay, Troy, I, I pass the conch to you. <laughs> he passed the conch to you. Yeah, because I might, I might want to get the spirit of the question because I know – I, I I try to be so super objective when I started this, but then I can't. I, there's too many Minnesota hockey players that I, are just my favorite for different reasons, and they might not be the most statistically, uh, what's the highest rated from a stats yeah. perspective. So I went down a whole other rabbit hole, and you'll see why I chose some of the players that I did. But I absolutely love this question, and I like the way I went about it because it gives me a couple different names than what you have because it would be boring if yep. you had the same list. So for goalie, I go Damian Rhodes. Why Damian Rhodes? Because he's from where I grew up, Richfield, Minnesota. He played at Richfield High School. He was my goalie coach for a couple of years while I was in high school during the summers. Played over 300 games in the NHL. Fantastic guy. I loved watching him play. He was a guy I always rooted for. Obviously, I had a little personal connection. So my goalie is Damian Rhodes. 
First D, again, like Josh said, Phil Housley, absolute no-brainer. From St. Paul, played for South St. Paul back when they were good. And he is the all-time leading scorer for Minnesota, which I didn't even know until I, I did the research. My other D would be Mike Ramsey, played at Roosevelt High School, member of the 1980 Olympic gold medal winning Miracle on Ice team. That's a, hand, mouth, or a yeah. mouthful to say. But I like getting some of the Miracle on Ice guys. Forward, Neil Broughton, obviously another no-brainer, like Josh said. Played at Roseau High School. Played for the Gophers. Played for the North Stars. I don't know. Doesn't get more Minnesotan than that, I guess. You got all of them hit. Second all-time point scorer for Minnesota. Won an NCAA championship. Olympic gold medal on a Stanley Cup. And as we learned, he and Ed Belfer were the only ones to do that. Won the Hobie Baker Miracle on Ice, all that fun stuff. All right, I have an important question for you. Yes. Who's the greatest hockey player born in Minnesota? Is it Phil Housley or Neil Broad? Hmm. I don't know. I'd probably go Neil Broad, but you probably get arguments that John Masich would fall yeah. into that category. Some of these old timers. Forgiving John Masich. Yeah. So there's, it's a great question. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll I like Broughton, but Housley was definitely good too. All right, my next four is Dave Christian, played at War Road High School. Again, another member of the 80 Olympic Miracle on Ice team. Played over 1,000 games in the NHL. Member of the family that created Christian Brother Hockey Sticks, if anyone remembers them. It's funny because I always go back to that expo where they were talking about how Canadians don't really care about Miracle on Ice <laughs> and Americans don't really care about the Summit Series because I, I feel like my Canadian friends are going to be tuning me out because I've had too many Miracle on Ice guys. My last four, Darby Hendrickson, totally homer pick as he played at Richfield High School. He won Mr. Hockey, played for the Wild, currently a Wild assistant coach, played for the Gophers, absolute fantastic high school and college player, played over 500 games in the NHL. He kind of a player I've always rooted for. He actually was one of the first, I think he was the first shot I ever faced at a high school practice because he was a senior when I was a freshman and he almost broke my hand. It hurts so much when, you, when I got hit with it in the glove. But that would be my starting six. Okay, I'm going to make a correction. Okay. This, I may have said just from Eveleth. Oh, it's from Eveleth? Yeah, people are going to get mad at me. For Close that. enough. Uh, Mariucci all... played at Hibbing briefly. Okay. That's, so... a, that's the other one I was thinking, too. Mariucci would be another one you could argue. Yeah. Just for the, so... the amount of importance to the game of hockey in Minnesota. Yeah, I let my hometown down there a little bit. And I just want to mention briefly while we're on the topic of uh, Hibbing for a second. Uh, today, Monday, uh, massive uh, memorial service for Adam Johnson. Oh, yeah. I think people coming over from everywhere, they're, the whole town is going all out. And so thoughts and prayers, of course, with everyone that's uh, there for that. Uh, great question. Next question, Instagram, Braun. I can't understand why Upper Deck won't disclose or reveal print counts like Young mm -hmm. Guns or Silver Outbursts, etc. What's the big deal? I don't know if we've ever got the official answer on this, or I just don't remember it. But I just don't I think, think we they, have. I don't think they want people to be able to estimate the size of their customer base. And, yeah. And I think there's like, if if you knew like how many Connor McDavid young guns were printed, you know, value is like largely perceptive in sports cards markets. I think your perception of the rarity would be pretty shattered at that point, and it wouldn't be a good thing for the hobby. Do you agree or disagree with that? Yeah, and I he's actually the president of Upper Deck has been on Jeremy's show. I think the last time he actually they got into that discussion and it basically came down to they weren't they just don't want to <laughs> they don't want to announce it. Yeah. Instagram Luigi 32.123 is Nylander a buy? Well, I would say Luigi from a PC perspective, sure, always a buy. Investment wise, he's off to a scorching start this season. He's got like six goals, nine assists, 15 points in 11 games. He's still, though, the third fiddle in Toronto behind Matthews and Marner. And so I, I think a guy like this, you're going to see spikes when he's going crazy like he is now. But over, over the long haul, as like an investment, he's just going to have a hard time. It's like the whole Miko Rantanen thing. It's like mm -hmm. there's just a million players like this that on these loaded teams. And so, you know. Again, I think from a PC perspective or like in the greater Toronto area or amongst the fans that, uh, you know, you'll have a market, but not in the greater hobby. 
That's way better right. answer than I could have gave. <laughs> All right, next question is Nolan Brakes. And he has a little bit of a uh, uh, kind of a he needed to vent. And so I appreciate this. So I'm just <laughs> going to read it quickly and then we'll comment. And it's our last question today. But he says, apologies if this has been discussed previously, but I need to air some grievances with the new flagship format. Initially, I was excited to hear about the addition of more Young Gun Parallels, Deluxe, Outburst, Red, 101, etc. But in my experience, I've pulled most of these new and exciting Parallels in the base set format. Through the nine hobby boxes I've opened, I've got one Outburst the Young Guns, seven base Outburst, and two Deluxe base Parallels. I guess this was as advertised, albeit under the guise of Young Guns, but I can't help feeling a little bit misled. Kind of disappointing to rip three straight boxes and pull a new big chase cards of vets from the base set. I was incorrectly assuming that outbursts would become somewhat of a silver panini in mm. terms one, maybe two outbursts, young guns per hobby box, the deluxe, while the deluxe and outburst red would be understandably tough and random. Ultimately, I think it pumps up the value to make them tough to hit and keeps the value of base young guns alive. Although these new young gun parallels would kill base young gun, or I thought these new young gun parallels would kill base young gun, but I think upper deck misled us customers with this new format and pulling an outburst Andrew Peak base card as a box hit wasn't on my bingo card for series one. So I totally get where you're coming from, Nolan. And as we had it explained to us, the outburst silver is really the replacement for the French variation. So yeah. it really runs the same way. So every base card in the past had a French version as well as every young gun. And so when it comes down to it, there's 200 base cards in the series one set and 50 young guns. That means that in 20% of the boxes, you'll actually get an, out, an outburst, which would have been equivalent to the French. But then 80%, you're just going to get base cards. So I think yeah. you have to kind of keep that frame of mind that it's really the same configuration that the French version had. and They just replaced that card design with the new outburst. Anything to add to that? Nope. All right, for personal pickups, we, uh, we're striking out. But no, so. I think we got a good excuse, though, right? Because we're... Yeah. Uh, it's the expo. We want to spend our money there. Yep. All right. If you like the episode, please leave a rating review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, you want to support us, you want to chat with us every day on the Hockey Cards Gong Show Discord server, please consider $5 a month donation. Join our auto $199 support level tier on Patreon. The link is in the show description for whatever podcast app you're listening to us on. It's in the YouTube description if you're watching us there. You can go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com, and click on the Become a Patron link. You can go to the Patreon website at patreon.com and just search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. Or there's a link in our link tree in our Instagram and TikTok profiles. We are on social media. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures, LLC. Have an awesome Monday, a great start to your week. We can't wait to be back with you this Thursday.